Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to our presentations today on data science applications and machine learning. Um, I'm very excited for the work that's being done by our presenters here and so glad they have the opportunity to share it with us today. My name is Emily Thomas, and I'm the director of data analytics and strategic planning for the employment and training administration at the Department of Labor. Though um, I was at BLS for 16 years before moving over to ETA, so I've been in these presenter shoes many of times, and I'm delighted to be back here with you all today, learning about the work that's going on. Um, as a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, I just want you all to know that at this time, all attendees are in a listening only mode. This session is being recorded and it will be posted publicly. So if you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And also just to let everyone know, um, we're going to have Q&A at the end. We'll have about 20, 30 minutes for that at the end of this entire session following the last presentation. So we'll go right through all the presentations and then we'll have open Q&A at the end. And you'll either be able to type in your question in the chat or you can raise your hand and go ahead and ask your question that way. Um, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So our first presentation today is going to be using machine learning recommendations to improve manual survey text coding. And that will be presented to us today by Caroline Carey and Dirk Steed. Caroline is a research data scientist from the Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at RTI International. She has a master's degree in computer science and splits her time between software development and data analytics, supporting RTI projects in criminal justice, public health and education, and in her free time, she loves to crochet, make candles, and work on other crafts, and uh, the supply of which are slowly taking over her house, which um, I can relate to. Dirk is a software engineer from the Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence at RTI International. He has a bachelor's degree in computer science and economics, and works on various projects concerning data analytics and visualization. And so in this presentation today, they're gonna discuss the tasks of manually survey coding and the complexities it can bring to large survey projects. So they're gonna discuss one of the methods that they employed to address these issues. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Caroline and Dirk. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Emily, for introducing us. Uh, so let me share my screen and we will be off. All right. Okay, can everyone see the slides? All right, I'm going to assume that is a yes. Um, yeah. So, yes, I'm I'm Caroline Carey, and I'm presenting with Dirk Steed. Uh, we're from RTI International, and so today we're going to discuss um, something that we run into a lot at RTI, and this is sort of uh, manual survey text coding. Uh, it's it's just a process that can show up a whole lot on these large surveys. And then we're going to discuss something that some of our groups at RTI have used to try to uh, address. Uh, some of the difficulties that come from this task. So I guess a, a quick definition of what I'm talking about. So when you're collecting a large survey, sometimes there's going to be those text based responses, either, you know, it may be an open text response, or it could just be a, like an other field. Um, and in order to use those, when you're trying to do downstream stream analysis, usually those responses will get coded in a variety of ways. So someone will look through and they will label those responses by categories so that that way they can now be quantified to know how many people chose what category, uh, things like that. And so oftentimes, depending on how co complicated the categories are or just um, what the requirements are for the survey, um, there's also uh, inner rate of re reliability requirements. So the, the idea that coders need to um, to be thinking of the labels or the codes in the same way, and you want consistency between coders with the same, would two people choose the same code. Uh, and so this means not only do you need to label all these texts, but you also need to often have several people label the same text. Um, so it, it kind of increases how much needs to be actually done. Um, and so it can be really a bit challenging to do this kind of thing. Um, you need to have some subject matter knowledge. Uh, about what, how someone might fill in this response. Um, you know, people might use abbreviations, they're going to use misspellings, uh, they might use sort of a, a colloquialism for the, the term that you're looking for. Um, and so that can kind of, that can kind of make it difficult or at least require, you require you to really have people who, who know the area and know what they're trying to code. Um, and so, 
but you're also going to be sitting down and just coding things over and over again. Generally, it is something that uh, is just not very fun. <laughs> um, we've at RTI, we've run into this over and over again, where it's like, it's a big thing that you have to do. Uh, you can't, you know, do nothing with these text responses. Um, but nobody really likes it. And unfortunately, it can often take a lot more time and money than projects are initially expecting it to, um, given that it's not really the the more interesting part of the project. Uh, so, you know, why, why does it happen so often? Um, you probably already are thinking of, you know, there's a lot of times where you might fill out a survey or give a survey and there is those open text fields. Uh, you know, you may have a lot of fields will want to provide an other option. Um, sometimes you don't know what, uh, what you're looking for yet. You know, you, you want to give people the opportunity to put, to give feedback and you're, you don't know what kind of feedback they're going to give. So you really do need to give them that ability to just say whatever is on their mind about the topic. Um, and sometimes uh, what you can also run into is where uh, either it's a, you know, a person giving the survey or the person filling out the survey, there actually are codes they're supposed to be selecting, but maybe they don't always put the complete code or maybe sometimes they, they don't write a code at all. Uh, or maybe they, they put something down because they don't have time to look for which code is the correct one. So even sometimes when you don't have a free text field, you can still end up in a, it, with a um, situation where you need to classify this text. So um, what are some common solutions? So this is something people have been dealing with for a very long time, and there's quite a few different ways to address it. Um, one is just what a lot of people do is just try to minimize the amount of free text that you're going to have to code. Just be, generally try to be thoughtful about, about those free response fields. Don't, you know, don't put them everywhere. This is also very helpful for, you know, survey burden. You don't want to try to ask someone to write, you know, a whole bunch of paragraphs. Um, isn't always an option uh, for the reasons that we've already talked about. Um, another idea is to use an automated coding system. And this is definitely something that a lot of uh, groups have done pretty successfully. Um, and that's just where you have some kind of algorithm to predict what the code is going to be. And, um, and that way a human doesn't have to go through it. Uh, this is this is pretty uh, can be a really great solution depending on what's what is the um, depending on the domain and depending on the requirements. Uh, sometimes there are requirements that everything must be human reviewed. So even if you have an autocoder, someone still needs to check the results. Um, it, but that is um, something that uh, can work very well. Of course, it also depends on how much shorthand you're expecting to be seeing and can the autocoder pick up on it? Can it deal with it? So uh, what a lot of groups do, pass around an Excel file, uh, just have, you know, here's, here's the text, go assign a code. And actually, this is something that's sort of the, the obvious thing that people will just do. If you, gotta, if you don't have a ton of things, it can work fine. You know, here's, here's the text, here's the codes, go, go work in Excel. Um, it can get a lot more difficult the bigger the task is, the more things to code, especially if you have a lot of people who need to work on the same data. It can get a lot more, oh, the management burden gets a lot higher. Um, so, but that's still, you know, still always a solution. Um, and the last piece is something that we're gonna talk about, which is a labeling software. So uh, there are, you know, this is a, a issue that's been around for quite a while, and so there's, uh, there's software that has been built to address it. And so uh, what we're going to talk about today is one particular software, uh, which is our kind of our homegrown solution. <laughs> uh, so we have an open source uh, labeling software called SMART. Um, it was developed, uh, I don't know, quite a few years ago at this point, originally to help people coordinate labeling items for building machine learning data sets. So it was originally not survey focused, um, but um, over, over time, over the last years, we found various groups that really were looking for something and we've, we've been shifting SMART towards having a use case for uh, also being usable for these kind of survey situations. Uh, we do have a new open source release, which we are working on pushing out in the next few weeks that adds all of those features that we built for these various survey teams, uh, updates the docs, generally gets everything um, more up to date. Um, 
so yes, we're very excited about that and are working on those docs uh, this week. So, so SMART is something that's we've kind of been building over time. And just, uh, I'm not entirely sure, I hope these are, are possible to see, um, but just a few uh, things of what SMART kind of looks like. On the right hand side, you, you see what it would show a person in terms of um, at the top. Uh, we have our, our very, uh, our very silly example here is specifically just uh, coding Reddit posts as being about a cat. That's our, that's what our docs use as a, you know, as a safe data set to, to just uh, let people experiment with. Um, and you can see that the, the person can look through this. They can read, okay, here's the text I need to label. And SMART is going to suggest some labels depending on the text that it's seeing there. And we'll talk about more about that. Um, and also you can see some additional data that was provided with the text, which can be very important for, for labeling your item. Um, on the left, we also have an array of reliability metrics. So this is what would help an administrator look and see how well people are agreeing. Do their, if SMART hands out a certain amount of data to the coder, to multiple coders, and you can set that percentage, what percent gets double coded or triple coded. And in the back end, the IRR metrics will be calculated to try to let you know how well are coders agreeing and where are they specifically not agreeing. So that is that is smart. Uh, it is one of many pieces of labeling software. And really the question always comes up of why. Why, why, why should we use this? You know, we would need to develop more things. Maybe it doesn't have quite what we need yet. We need to add features. So, so why would the RTI teams want to use it? So probably one of the first ones is it is open source. So it is free. <laughs> so there's no licensing. Uh, it already exists. So, and it's pretty easy for our team to, to work on it, right? Because it's, we already have the developers, you know, they, they sit right across from everybody else. And the survey teams have a lot of control over what features they want to see added and where they want to see the software go. So maybe not so much an advertisement for why you should use SMART, but this is sort of the, the logic that goes through when different groups uh, are choosing their labeling software. So SMART is a little more, you need more developing time maybe than some other very, um, uh, established and long-term product, but you have a lot more influence over, over things and may have an easier time communicating. So, uh, so that's sort of the, was the logic there. And so here's some examples of how SMART has adapted for these survey teams. And so specifically, we looked at some of the things that were frustrating them about their current solutions of which they they were using a variety of different things. Um, and they were there was annoyances about deduplication of trying to trying to fix mistakes when they're when you're coding something for some uh some software that that what they were using it was extremely complicated for someone to go back and change a label they had already set they were they needed to be able to continuously have new data roll in as survey respondents um, answered things and be able to load that in and now somebody can code it and they also just had lots and lots of labels. So maybe when you were, were trying to classify text, if there's 5,000 labels, even the act of scrolling down to find the obvious label that goes with that text did it was actually a fairly time consuming burden. So we worked with SMART to try to make it as easy as possible for, for these teams to get done what they were trying to do. So there's significant deduplication options in SMART. Uh, the history table makes it uh, as easy as possible to go in, change your past labels, and it's so if you make a mistake, you can just go over and fix it. And also, we've added in uh, schedule database imports and exports, so someone can set up a database connection uh, in Smart to import things from their database and then export labeled things on a daily basis. Um, and so the last piece is the one that we want to talk about. And this is trying to find the right label for your text. So how can we try to do this? Uh, we've already talked about autocoders. There is some complications there for, you know, you have to have, you have to bring in the subject matter knowledge. You have to bring in um, 
a lot a lot of things to be able to predict sometimes what someone's shorthand hair, you know, shorthand string really translates to. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna switch over to Dirk. Um Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Hey, all, my name is Dirk. I'm a software engineer at RTI, and I've been working with Caroline and the team on the SMART project. And I'm going to go into more detail on how we used text embeddings to tackle some of those uh, large surveys that SMART encountered and the problems that Caroline kind of outlined at the beginning. So, like Caroline mentioned, SMART was originally designed for smaller projects with just a few labels. But we quickly learned that surveys can, and they often do, have hundreds, if not thousands of labels. And finding the correct label manually for the coders was increasingly more and more time consuming the larger the survey grew. Originally, we decided to propose a label suggestion feature that just used simple text similarity. And we found that it alleviated many of the pain points that our coders were facing. However, we knew that we could still do better than that. So next slide, please. We decided to use text embeddings, which are vector representations of text that can be mathematically compared. And neither one of us had ever used these before, so we integrated a free and open source Python library called Sentence Transformers to perform these embeddings and their calculations. And what immediately separated text embeddings apart from our original simple solution was that these text embeddings could capture the underlying meanings of different pieces of text. For example, a piece of text about horses and another piece of text about equestrians could be determined to have similarity, whereas in our old simple text algorithm, that would not have been determined. So next slide, please. This is just a quick uh, screenshot to show how this implementation was used in SMART. For projects with more than five labels, we configured SMART to automatically generate these text embeddings for each one of those labels. And then in the yellow box in the screenshot, you can see that SMART automatically presents a survey coder with the top five suggested labels determined by their text embeddings and the similarity they have with the text embedding of the data to label. And before text embeddings, survey coders had to manually search through a dropdown that could contain hundreds, if not thousands of labels. Uh, next slide, please. So what were, what were the results of doing this? Just by replacing our simple text similarity solution with the text embeddings, we immediately improved the accuracy of SMART. It went from about 43% accuracy previously to 56% without any configuration at all. Then we refined our solution and trained a custom model to use to generate the text embeddings, and we saw the accuracy go up to greater than 70%. And so this really allowed the survey coders to be able to work more efficiently and have a drastically higher quality of life user experience while using SMART. Next slide. With all the improvements that text embeddings gave us on SMART, we learned several technical lessons that we think are worth sharing. First, the embeddings can be kind of a mysterious black box that we, that's how we call it. Um, it's kind of, you put some text into a, a box, the box gives you a mathematical text embedding back but it can be difficult to actually view and understand what actually happens inside that box. We found that in order to get the best results from text embeddings, careful vetting was extremely important. In addition, text embeddings could not always pick up on important context without being trained to do so. For example, specific acronyms or terms for one project might have completely different meanings on a second project. We also found that sometimes text embeddings needed to be explicitly told what pieces of text they should or should not be associated with. For example, we may want the acronym STEAM to have an underlying meaning of science, technology, engineering, art, and math on a specific project. But we may also want the term woman to not be so closely, so closely associated with the term home economics. And sometimes the model doesn't know what we want, so we have to train it and kind of give it a helping hand to, to do that. Lastly, it's important to note that text embeddings are large and they can be very slow. So we found it very important to be extremely careful and strategic about how and when you're using them. Next slide. 
We also discovered several lessons for implementing text embeddings when you're working on a team. Um, having a subject matter expert is essential and being okay with an okay solution and then iterating to a great one later, that's okay. As I mentioned before, we went from originally requiring manual labeling to then having simple text similarity to then just using text embeddings and then training our own text embeddings model. And each step along the way, as we iterated on SMART, the survey coders were extremely happy with the gradual improvements being added. Related to this, getting user testing and feedback was crucial to delivering successful updates. And it's important to trust your team and your users that they will ask and that they know what they want. So next slide. In conclusion, SMART has seen a lot of significant updates and improvements thanks to text embeddings. Um, that being said, we still have more goals for SMART in the future. We're working on improving text embeddings and making them more customizable for each project and working more closely with the SMEs for each project that are using SMART. We want to incorporate past labeled data to help train and inform future text embeddings being generated in SMART. And RTI is currently funding an internal research and development initiative to investigate these features. So be on the lookout for more open source releases with these features in the coming months. And next up, and thank you so much to everyone for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us or um, email us at the emails on the slide on the screen. Thank you so much again. Um, and it's from John and it's asking, how did you measure the text string accuracy? Did you use another program or did you use humans? So uh, do, I can go ahead and answer this and then Caroline, you can yeah, act on. We uh, worked with one of our projects and they gave us a um, training data set and some of the, some labels that they already had and what um, they, or some data that they already had and some labels that they wanted that to be matched with. And we just um, did a simple test running um, that data set through SMART and seeing if it found that correct label in the top five suggestions. And then if it did, we deem that as accurate. All right, excellent. And we'll have some more time at the end for additional questions so we can do that. But thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you so much, Dirk. Let's um that was that was a great presentation. So very exciting to learn about your work. Let's move along now. Um, so next up we have Daniel Todd. Daniel is a data scientist working for labor statistics. The compensation research. And his talk is going to cover a case study that he performed. Regarding as well as detection and translation. So thanks so much, Daniel. Take it away. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Howdy folks, my name is Danny Todd uh, and um, as Emily just told you, I'm a data scientist working in the Office of Safety, Health and Working Conditions uh, for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm here to talk to you today about a case study we performed uh, on the soy autocoder. Uh, so before we get into the case study, I'd like to just give a quick background for those who aren't familiar. Uh, about what the soy is. Uh, so this, the soy is an establishment survey annually uh, collecting written descriptions of over 300 or sorry, 200,000 work related injuries and illnesses each year. Uh, these descriptions include information regarding job titles, what workers were doing when an injury occurred and so on. Uh, in order to better understand uh, the information and data contained within these cases, uh, we assign codes to several fields to categorize them appropriately uh, according to the Occupational Injury and Illness Classification System, or OICS. So here we have an example uh, soy case uh, where we have all of the information such as job title, what the uh, employee was doing, um, and what caused their injuries. Um, and we can also further assign codes to each of those sections to uh, essentially standardize and classify 
each of these cases accordingly. Uh, since 2014, the Office of Safety, Health, and Working Conditions at the Bureau of Labor Statistics has been implementing supervised machine learning methods to automatically predict and assign codes to these cases. So currently, um, the autocoder being supervised has a labeled data set, and it is known largely to be in English. Um, similar to training a neural network on dogs and then asking it to classify a cat, we're currently training our network using primarily English cases and potentially asking it to classify Spanish cases. Um, so we know these cases exist. Uh, ultimately, it just leads to the question, would detecting and translating these cases increase the performance of the network? To answer this, uh, we came up with the following approach. Um, if we detect and translate these cases within our data set, we can then compare two autocoders which are trained on uh, those data sets side by side. One compared uh, just with the standard non-translated data set and one compared, or uh, the other being with the detected and translated data set. Uh, in order to tackle this problem, um, several options exist. Most of them tend to use machine learning, um, as I'm sure you're all well aware with the recent boom of uh, technologies such as chat GPT. Um, the, the problem being with a lot of these open source options, though, is that they don't necessarily protect data privacy. Um, and so for our case within the SOI, uh, we need to run all of these locally, which somewhat limits the options that we can investigate. Um, so for this case study, we chose to investigate two primary methods, uh, the Python Lang Detect module um, and the Hugging Face XLM Roberta uh, large language model. Um, so to begin with, um, we, we don't necessarily know where these Spanish cases exist, but we are aware um, that cases from Puerto Rico are frequently believed to be in Spanish. So to keep a small scope initially, we used a subset of our data uh, only from Puerto Rico to evaluate a model's capability to detect the languages before letting it loose on the entire data set. Um, the LangDetect package was giving case narratives and asked to predict the language of approximately 40,000 cases. Um, for each code field, we asked the LangDetect model to predict, and uh, if the predictions didn't have enough confidence, uh, it resulted in it classifying it as none. Um, ultimately, we wound up finding over 50% of cases were labeled as none. Um, and excluding these non cases, uh, we still found that uh, languages other than Spanish and English were predicted in over 31% of cases. Uh, this high error rate with a large amount of cases still unclassified left a lot uh, to be des uh, desired. Um, and so before letting it loose on the entire data set, we wanted to try our other method to see if that was more promising. Here we have uh, the language detection results for the Exelon Roberta uh, base on the Puerto Rican subset. And uh, right out of the box, this model performed much better than the Lang Detect model. Um, it still did need some tinkering to optimize it, um, but far fewer languages were being predicted and the results were consistent with what our subject matter experts expected. Um, and ultimately, this eliminated all non classifications, which were very prevalent in the Lang Detect model. Um, it should be noted that there still are several other languages that are being predicted, uh, but for translation, we can just apply a simple filter and only keep uh, cases which are uh, either believed to be English or Spanish. So from these results, we can extrapolate by pulling a small subset and manually evaluating them. Um, and extrapolating from the Puerto Rican data set, um, we selected 300 cases randomly, um, and we wanted to see, sure, it may say it predicted Spanish or English, but were the cases really in Spanish or English? Um, 
it predicted the sentiment was English and was incorrect about 31% of the time, whereas if it predicted Spanish, it was incorrect about 2% of the time. So it was relatively confident and uh, accurate with that. Um, from these metrics, we can actually extrapolate to determine that uh, Puerto Rico likely has approximately 60 to 70% of their annual cases, which are in uh, Spanish. Um, which still falls neatly in line with what our uh, subject matter experts had anticipated. Um, once we established the model was performing reasonably well, we let it loose on the entire US data set uh, to see what languages it predicted. Ultimately, 98% of US cases were detected in English, uh, with no individual state having over 2.5% of cases being anything other than English. Um, it should also be noted that all languages predicted in the chart shown um, were predicted, even though they were predicted very infrequently. Um, and so excluding the small percentage of these outliers, uh, this falls neatly in line again with uh, what our subject matter experts had predicted uh, would be contained within our data set. Um, and we felt it was accurate enough to feed to a translation model. Um, so, several models were experimented with their abilities to translate, but for the purpose of this presentation um, and the case study, uh, we're sticking to the Opus MTESEN translations. Um, many of the models that we experimented with uh, claimed to be able to translate multiple languages. Others were extremely specific and only translated from one language to another. Um, after some experimentation, a uh, noticeable difference in the ability to translate common phrases was noted uh, with the multi-language models. And as such, we decided to go with this specific model uh, to translate explicitly from Spanish to English. Um, all cases were chosen from this using our previous filter, um, but for just uh, curiosity's sake, we did choose to include uh, cases where the predicted language was Portuguese, given the uh, just similarity between uh, Portuguese and Spanish. Um, from that, we took a subset of 100 randomly selected cases um, and gave each of those 100 to a uh, reviewer to evaluate whether the translations were accurate or not. Um, overall, we found about 62.5% of Spanish translations to be deemed acceptable, um, with 57.5% of Portuguese translations to be uh, deemed acceptable as well. Um, ultimately, these figures were indeed lower than expected, and much of this is attributed uh, not necessarily to the translations as a whole, but specific words being incorrectly translated. Um, for example, body parts were frequently mistranslated, um, and the network also frequently returned the same Spanish word uh, without actually translating it, uh, particularly for uh, slang terms. Um, and it should also be noted that uh, Portuguese did perform similarly to Spanish, indicating that the detection in the previous uh, step likely misclassified them, and we can consider those uh, to be Spanish cases. Um, those the, though the discrepancies aren't optimal, it was still necessary to see how these translations could impact the autocoder's performance. Um, and so in order to test this, we uh, had two data sets, um, one trained using the detected and translated inputs and the other trained using non-translated, just standard inputs. Um, the resulting labels that we were expecting the models to predict um, were identical uh, across both data sets. So finally, onto the results. Um, so to test the soy neural network, we kept a Puerto Rican holdout set on top of our standard gold standard cases, uh, which are not shown during training. Um, the gold standard have been heavily validated um, by multiple reviewers to ensure that all of their codes are accurate. Um, it should be noted that no Spanish cases were in our uh, gold standard data set, though. Um, but ultimately, the gold standard's purpose is to know uh, that the model isn't cheating by memorizing things within the training data set. 
so ultimately our results showed performance decreases across the board uh, with the model trained on translated inputs. Uh, both our accuracy and F1 scores decrease on both holdout data sets, though not necessarily by a significant amount. Uh, so overall, what do these results tell us? Since we saw a decrease in both accuracy and F1 score across both data sets, uh, this implies the autocoder is capable of classifying Spanish cases successfully in its current state, um, and that translations are insufficient at providing an increase of information to the neural network. Um, if anything, it's actually possibly removing it via our translations, um, which somewhat falls in line with what our reviewers observed with uh, the specific words and phrases not being translated appropriately. Um, additionally, the decrease in ability to predict on our gold standard English only data set reinforces the belief that these translations were actually decreasing the model's ability to comprehend English and essentially adding noise to our data set. Um, from our detection results, we can, however, extrapolate on the contents of our data set. Um, overall, only a very small portion of US cases are believed to be in Spanish, um, with approximately 1% of total cases uh, being believed to be in Spanish, uh, when including uh, our Puerto Rican data set. Uh, this falls, again, uh, directly in line with what our subject matter experts had predicted. Um, so, these cases are not heavily represented and the representation they do have uh, appears to be sufficient to allow for no loss in performance. Um, ultimately, as technology progresses and open source detection and translation methods continue to increase, um, it may be worthwhile for us to uh, revisit this case study uh, with a, possibly a more uh, capable detection and translation uh, pipeline. Um, there, there are several approaches in addition to those investigated in this case study, uh, which could potentially improve the performance and give us further insight into the full scope of the impacts which are caused by multi languages being used uh, in a model that is trained specifically with one. Uh, but we'll save those for another day. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to the computer assisted coding team, um, as well as our Spanish translation reviewers. And finally, open the floor up for questions. All right, so I'm gonna start out with the question that we see in the chat. So, um, did you run into cases where the correctness of the language classification or translation could not be determined due to the text being ambiguous, such as using terms that exist in both languages or just invalid? And how did you handle those if you came across any? Um, so, I don't want to speak about those specifically, uh, strictly for the fact that the cases that would fall under that, I don't actually speak Spanish. Um, but from talking to our reviewers, um, I, I can ultimately confirm that, yeah, that, that was an issue throughout where there were a lot of ambiguous, like the translation might have been acceptable enough, but ultimately at the end of the day, um, we have the codes that were assigned to it previously. And so we wanted our translation to allow for the reviewer to essentially be able to code that same code again. And the translations that did not allow for that, we we just had to go with a binary pass fail system. Um, so, uh, yeah, at, at the, again, that is my takeaway from speaking with the reviewers and going through the pass fail system. Hopefully, that answers your question. Yeah. So we have one from Mary Drummond as well. So, how did these sorts of cases factor into the error rates? Um, so specifically the Spanish cases, uh, were almost exclusively the cause of the decrease in error. We saw almost all of them, um, which were the translated cases within the Puerto Rican holdout set be, uh, directly related to, uh, errors that were, uh, propagated and shown in our metrics. Um, but there were, uh, as, as noted, 
um, in, in our metrics, uh, in the gold standard, we also saw a decrease and that was actually just on English cases. Um, so yeah, not, not only were we seeing decreases in um, the Spanish cases and the ability to classify those, but it was also uh, subsequently essentially adding noise to our data set and making us less capable of classifying uh, English data sets. All right, thank you, Danny. Any other questions? We'll have time for some more at the end if, if there's more questions at the end. Anything else quickly now? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my email and whatnot is uh, on the screen now. And um, yeah, thank you guys very much. We had one more follow up for you. So, um, was privacy a need? This is from Mary again. So, was privacy a need for concern while using the language detection package, or was all of the language detection and translation done locally? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. All, uh, all of the detection translation models, everything was run locally. Um, just out of curiosity, specific body parts that weren't getting translated, right? We did like test those with uh, Google translate or whatnot to say, like, oh, can Google translate translate? I, I forget the specific words, but for like arm being incorrectly translated. Well, Google translate can do that, which made us desire to use the open source methods, but ultimately, yeah, the data privacy made us have to run every aspect of this case study locally. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, all right. So next up, we have a presentation on when data labels become obsolete. So this is going to be about updating the soy autocoder to OIX version 3.2. And that presentation is going to be given by David O. And David is a BLS data scientist working for the Office of Compensation and Working Conditions, Compensation Research and Development Group. And David oversees various data science that use machine learning and natural language quality and scope of the statistics from the National Compensation Survey and the Survey of Occupational Injuries and and the census of fatal So the presentation today is going to cover the methods that are currently being explored to enable the soy autocoder to learn the new labels X version 3.2. So excited to learn about that. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Emily. Um, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining this session today. Uh, my name is David O. Um, and I am a data scientist in the Office of Compensation and Working Conditions at BLS. Uh, so the presentation that I'll be giving today is titled, When Labels Become Obsolete, Updating Soy Autocoder to OX version 3. So uh, BLS recently completed a major update to the Occupational Injury and Illness Classification System, simply referred to as OX, uh, going from version 2.01 to version 3. Uh, and this begs the question, what happens to a machine learning model when the labels in its training data become obsolete? Um, this presentation will focus on sharing the preliminary results from our attempt at addressing this question for our soy autocoder, which um, Danny uh, discussed uh, briefly um, uh, mentioned during his presentation and discuss the next steps that uh, we plan to take. So I will begin the presentation by first providing some background information on our survey, our autocoder, and the nature of um, working with standardized classification systems. Then I will go on to describe the challenges that the recently updated um, OIX poses on our autocoder, discussing the preliminary results from employing a traditional approach using a simple crosswalk. And after that, I'll end by discussing our next step, which involves investigating a more complex method known as weak supervision. Also at this point, I would like to mention a disclaimer here that this project is still ongoing. So the results presented here are preliminary and are subject to change. Okay, so the survey of occupational injuries and illnesses, which you know Danny mentioned um, in his presentation, which um, we refer to SOI as short, is an establishment survey that has been collecting worker injury and Ill illness information since 1972. Uh, through this survey, we collect information on the total number of cases resulting in days away from work 
or days of um, job transfer and work restrictions, as well as um, detailed case and demographic information about some injury and illness cases. Every year, we collect more than 200,000 descriptions of work-related injuries and illnesses from this survey. So on, on this screen here uh, is an example of work-related injury case that we might collect for soy. Um, this is a narrative describing a sanitation worker who um, slipped on a wet floor while mopping the gym, fracturing the right arm. Um, these information are then used to assign five and sometimes even six codes. Uh, one code to indicate the occupation of the worker, uh, second code to indicate the nature of the injury, uh, the event that caused the injury, the part of body that was affected, and the object or substance um, that caused an injury or illness. Uh, for many years, uh, these codes were assigned manually by human coders. Um, and as you can, the, the example that's shown on the narrative here on the screen uh, is relatively straightforward to assign. Uh, but you can imagine that these manual coding can become very tedious when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of cases each year. And so came the computer assisted coding. Um, just to recap the timeline of our soy autocoder, it was first developed back in 2012 for review purposes. In 2014, we started using our autocoder to automatically code just a few of the occupation codes. And this worked pretty well, so we gradually expanded more from 2015 through 2017, coding also the codes for nature, part, event, and source. And in 2018, we moved over to a neural network architecture, increasing our performance and in enabling us to significantly expand our automated coding. Uh, during this time, we even expanded our autocoding to secondary source codes for the first time. And with our most recently collected data, the autocoder automatically assigned almost all of our codes. So you may know that the official statistics um, rely on the standard classification system to aggregate uh, microdata into meaningful statistics. Uh, you might already also be familiar with um, the North American industry classification system and also the um, standard occupational classification system. Uh, in addition to these classification systems, SOI also uses the Occupational Injury and Illness Classification System to classify workplace injury and illness, uh, illness cases into various components um, that I've shown earlier in the narrative example. And over the years, as the distribution of these categories that they cover change, these classifications are also updated. So um, these periodic updates result in new categories being created as well as old ones um, going away. So for example, in 2018, uh, with the 2018 uh, SOC update, we saw the introduction of data scientists as a new occupational category to better capture this emerging occupation. Uh, most recently, BLS completed a major update to OICS going from version 2.01 to version 3. Uh, this recent update uh, prioritized aligning codes with data user priorities, capturing information that is useful and relevant for targeting uh, safety and uh, health interventions, and also reflecting changing technologies or emerging areas of interest. Uh, the table shown on this slide uh, shows the counts of unique codes by OX type. Overall, the number of codes stayed relatively the same, going from version 2.01 to version 3, with some decrease in the number of codes, mostly coming from event. Uh, this newly updated code is expected to be used in data collection starting next year. And this means that starting in 2024, the SOI autocoder will also be required to assign codes using the updated OX. Uh, this poses a challenge for us because our autocoder is trained on a large quantity of labeled SOI cases using the previous OX, version 2.01 and is unable to assign the new set of codes that's introduced in the uh, version 3.0. So this brings us back to the research question that I shared in the beginning. What happens to an autocoder when the labels in its training data become obsolete? Uh, within the machine learning community, this is often referred to as a concept drift, where the labels from the training data no longer have the same definition as the data that the model is trying to predict. And unfortunately, there are very few discussions out there on how to address this problem. 
So what should we do then? Uh, one option would be for us to just stop autocoding for the time being until we've collected enough data using the new OX version to train a new model that's able to predict the uh, OX in version uh, 3.0. Um, this is basically reverting back to the time when all cases were manually coded by human staff. Another option would be to, for us to find a way to update the labels in the existing training data to version 3.0. Uh, at BLS, we are actively pursuing option two, investigating ways that we will uh, that will enable us to continue to autocode from year one of OX3 implementation. So for the rest of my presentation, I will focus mainly on the results from the traditional approach and briefly discuss at the end uh, the next step that we are taking to explore a more complex approach. So the first approach that we explored was what we refer to as a traditional approach, which is just using a simple crosswalk. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, crosswalking is a dictionary-based approach mapping uh, from one code to another. Uh, this approach is widely used whenever there are updates to a standardized classification systems like NAICS and SOC. Uh, in fact, we employed a slightly modified version of this approach when updating our training data to the new NAICS and SOC. Um, often provided along with these updated classification systems are a crosswalk file, which provides a simple way to translate the old codes into the new ones. Um, these crosswalk files usually contain two mapping types, one-to-one -one mapping and one-to-many mapping. Uh, the one-to-one -one mapping describes a situation where the definition of a, of a code using the older version, or it's version 2.01, is entirely captured within the definition of a single code in the new code version, uh, in our case, OX version 3. Uh, one to many mapping describes a situation uh, where the definition of a code using the uh, OX version 2.01 is not entirely captured by a single code in version 3. Instead, the code can be conditionally mapped to multiple code in OX version 3. Uh, shown on the screen here are the percentages of OX codes with one-to-one -one and one-to-many mapping types. Overall, 87% of OX version 2.01 codes are mapped to OX version 3 codes uh, through one-to-one -one mapping. And this means that a large proportion of version 2.01 codes can be directly translated into version 3 codes, which is a good sign avoiding you know, uh, the ambiguity involved in figuring out how to map an old code to a new set, new, uh, set of new codes. However, when we look at the actual training data, we find that a little over a quarter percentage of codes will require uh, one-to-many mapping, especially for nature and event. Uh, so you know, this should temper our expectation on how effective the soy autocoder will be when trained using, a, ju using just a um, sim simply crosswalk training data. And also before um, applying the crosswalk to our training data, we spent some time checking the integrity of the crosswalk file by testing it against one of our gold standard data sets. Um, this gold standard data set contains a small sample of soy cases that have been gold standard coded by our subject matter experts, both in OX version 2.01 and OX version 3. Uh, this enables us to crosswalk the old gold standard code and compare them against the new gold standard codes. Uh, for codes that were one to one mapping, the crosswalk was considered valid if the crosswalked code matched the version 3 gold standard code. And for codes that were uh, one-to-many mapping, the crosswalk was considered valid if any of the possible crosswalkable code matched the version three gold standard code. And here are the results. Um, for both one-to-one -one and one-to-many mappings, we would expect them to be valid 100% of the time if the crosswalk perfectly captures the transition from one version of OX to, the, to another. Um, however, as you can see, for both mapping types, we find pretty low match rates for event, source, and secondary source codes. Uh, although it could be argued that this is a quality issue with either versions of the gold standard codes, um, in general, um, what this test reveals to us is that crosswalk file that we are working with uh, might not be perfect. And with that in mind, we proceed to training a soy autocoder using this traditional approach. 
Uh, first, we apply Oryx crosswalk to more than 30 million Oryx version 2.01 codes. Uh, for codes with one-to-many mappings, we ran randomly mapped it to one of the possible options. And next, uh, we trained a soy autocoder using this um, simply crosswalk training data set using the same uh, model specification as the current production model. And finally, using a gold standard data set, we measured its performance. Uh, the results on the screen show the simply crosswalk model's performance and our current production model's performance side by side. And as you can see, our simply crosswalked model performs worse on every OX type compared to our current model. Um, differences in performance are especially large for nature and event, which were the codes with substantial one to many codes. Um, so, you know, this is expected as we are introducing noise into our labels through crosswalking, especially for those uh, that contain a lot of one to many mapping types. Um, nevertheless, uh, we believe that the results from this traditional approach can serve as sort of the baseline that we can um, baseline performance that we can benchmark other approaches that we'll be investigating next. And so this leads us to discussing some limitations using this traditional approach. Um, first, as revealed through the integrity test, um, our cro our OIX crosswalk is not perfect, and this result results in noise being introduced when crosswalking. While there are some efforts to fine tune the crosswalk as perfect as possible, it is likely that a simple um, dictionary based approach won't capture the entire um, nuance of OIX and its most recent revision. And what I mean by that is OIX isn't just a single set of codes like um, NAICS or SOC, but instead is a conglomeration of four different set of codes, um, categorizing various aspects of occupational injuries and illnesses like nature, part, event, source, um, that you know, somewhat depend on one another. Um, secondly, going from Oryx version 2.01 to version 3 resulted in some major changes, such as introducing new concepts, as well as reorganizing concepts across different Oryx types. Um, and these things can be very difficult to capture in a simple uh, crosswalk. And most importantly for these one-to-many mapping codes, there is just no simple way to ensure that they are crosswalked to the correct codes um, just from using a uh, simple crosswalk. And to address, address these limitations, I wanted to spend this last slide uh, discussing our next step, which is looking into weak supervision. Um, so weak supervision is defined as a broad collection of techniques in machine learning where models are trained using sources of information that are easily provided than hand labeled data. Um, these sources of information may be incomplete, inexact, or otherwise less accurate. Um, however, leveraging these multiple sources of information, um, users can programmatically um, create weakly labeled data through probabilistic models. Uh, given that we know there are many nuances that can't simply be captured within a, a simple crosswalk, we plan to supplement, um, supplement this file with other sources of information such as um, coding heuristics from our subject matter experts and uh, code relationships reflected in our edits file. Um, the tool most often used in this space is called Snorkel, and we plan to utilize this for our next step. And so that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Here's my contact information. And as I mentioned before, um, this is an ongoing project. So I'd love to chat with you if you have any suggestions or comments on what other methods we should explore next. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Does anybody have any questions for David? Okay, if anybody has anything, you can go right ahead and put that in the chat and um, we can go ahead and get on to the next presentation. And again, we can do some at the end. Okay, so our final presentation today is applying machine learning language models and to answer a caller's question. 
Monica Puerto is a data scientist at Accenture Federal Services with a master's in data science specializing in natural language processing. As a former director for the Women Who Code DC chapter, Monica is passionate about diversity and inclusivity in tech and is an avid presenter on data science and, and you can see some of her past presentations on monicapuerto.com. She also teaches at UMBC and is an adjunct professor for the data science program. So I'm um, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Monica. Thank you for having me. I know I'm the last presentations before lunch, but it's gonna be um, worth your while. So thanks again. Uh, share my screen. I just want to thank my co-authors from CBSM at Census and my supervisor, Brian, for having me present on our work. This is an ongoing research project for CBSM on how machine learning models, specifically natural language processing models, can help improve and automate some call center operations using machine learning, like the one for the decennial, where about 7,000 um, call agents answered millions of questions on responding to the 2020 census. So this is gonna focus on one process of our research project. And just a disclaimer, text examples of caller questions to the call center are paraphrased and examples and not word for word. Also note our disclaimer and disclosure number. I also wanna preface that the machine learning models we use are open source um, using Python but there has been traction among companies offering language models at a price, such as Google, Microsoft, and Amazon web services. And we have seen, obviously, in the internet, on um, the rise of models like ChatGPT. Um, this is an exciting time to be in the NLP space with major advancements in the last few years. So in this talk, I'm gonna show how we can use NLP language models to improve call center operations and make sense of millions of calls. These calls got the customer's permission to record their interaction when calling in for assistance during the 2020 census. So the first process is taking the audio and, um, and trans transcribing it into text so we can further process and use machine learning models that I will get into and analyze what were the questions of millions of people during the 2020 census. And we can come out with a range of topics of conversations via topic modeling. This is helpful to understand frequency and distributions of caller concerns. I'm not gonna go into the audio transcription part because my team presented on this last year at FedCASIC, which you can find on the FedCASIC website. We will be focused on taking the output of that process, which is the transcribed text and finding insights on topic modeling and also in process number two, how we can link the caller's question with our reference materials known as frequently asked questions aka faqs in an automated way so let's say a caller calls to ask and they did not receive a paper questionnaire using machine learning we can automatically answer the caller's question through an interactive voice response aka ivr with machine learning this automatically links the best faq to answer the caller's concern and if the IVR did not get it right, we can send them to an agent. Although with a successful 2020 operation, the agents had to search through an interface using keywords to bring up one of 300 different FAQs and without prior context. So this is an opportunity with machine learning that we can show the agent the model's top five predictions and limit the FAQ number that they have to deal with. So how do we do this? How do we link similar text? So how would we group these words together where the similar items are close together and the dissimilar items are far apart? We use math. Using math, we can take, we can calculate distances between things, um, more most formally vectors. So first we need to take this text and turn them into numbers. I won't go into what the numbers represent because that is in, um, discussed in the machine learning class. And just know each NLP model can represent text differently depending on the way, um, depending on the machine learning model that you use or the data that you use to train on. So we take the word cat and represent it as a vector of numbers. And these are called embeddings. We can take distances from each word embedding, and we can also visualize them, but we would need to reduce them down to a two-dimensional to be able to plot them. 
since words have meaning, since words have numbers that have meaning behind them, we can see that cat and kitten are plotted next to each other because they are similar versus they are far away from the house vector, but closer to the dog vector, and that makes sense. Another example below is where two different sentences, Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and the president greets the press in Chicago. At a word level, we can see how the synonym pairs of each sentence is plotted close together. So imagine measuring the distance between these vectors. Things that are similar have the smallest distance between each other, but we can also use cosine similarity, which is a measure of angles between vectors um, to measure similarity. Since I told you our project deals with recorded calls that have been transcribed into text, do you think it's possible to do this with our transcripts? The answer is yes. So imagine each dot on the screen is a transcript, which is a set of sentences. Each transcript is an array of numbers, like the one that you saw in the last slide and reduced down to a two dimensional. So we can plot these transcripts, aka conversations, and we can assume that transcripts plotted near each other are similar. We can then create boundaries and group them together. This technique is called um, topic modeling in an NLP setting or clustering. We can look for specific keywords in these transcripts and we can see how the word mortgage, which was one of the questions, the survey questions of the census, is mostly clustered together. Can we find other types of conversation can we understand the other groupings? And yes, we can. So this is an image of 65,000 conversations and we put them in a cluster model with 15 topics. So the model divide them among 15 groups. You can tweak this unknown prior, the topic number for your purpose, depending how detailed or high level you want the conversation topics to be. We can see that there are about 15 groupings can provide some high level information. We can see topics like caller concerns on verifying responses via clusters like verifying um, paper response or computer response in the left hand corner. And you can see they're clustered in their own groups, but the groups sit near each other. The group topic on not receiving a paper questionnaire yet or not having a computer and they need a paper sit near each other. Topics on special living situations, moving multiple residents and address issues are, are near each other since these are all related to an address. So now we know that the census dealt with all types of calls which the census prepared for and that's why we have so many FAQs. We have 300 different FAQs to answer all these callers concerns. So how do we then link a transcript of a particular concern to a specific FAQ in an automated way. We can create embeddings of the FAQs as well. So I showed you how we did it with the transcripts. So for the FAQs, what we did is combine as much text as we could, which was um, combining the FAQ title, the FAQ keywords, and the response that the agent used. And we combined them to one large string. And then we also created FAQ embedding representations of them. So then, like I told you, we can take um, distances from vectors and use math. We can then take each FAQ embedding and compare it to the embedding of the color transcript and use cosine distances and rank the best FAQ in terms of the highest cosine similarity to find the best FAQ to send back to the IVR. So cosine similarity ranges from zero to one, one being identical, versus zero being the least similar. So let's look at the case where the caller asks, I need help responding to the census. May I ask my daughter? Using an NLP model that understands context like BERT, we found that the best FAQ for that is, can I ask someone to help respond? This had a high cosine similarity because the words help responding and the words can I ask are in both. But it also understands context and knows a daughter is so just like how we saw the example that President and Obama and greets and meets are similar, that's why using a model that understands context is very useful in these settings. Now you can find the best FAQ for each transcript, but how do you know this methodology is working? How can we better measure this statistically at scale? So we create a representative labeled data set. 
So we know the model's prediction, but we can also add our own human label. And now I wish I knew about SMART before I did this manually in Excel. Um, and we can then calculate accuracy and the importance of a labeled data set is we can triage the same labeled data set across many models. So I'm gonna give you some examples of um, one model that we use, but we triage a variety of different models. So then now we can calculate accuracy, um, but how did you go about creating this labeled data set? So like I said, we had millions of calls and we can't label all of those calls. And here are some examples that are paraphrased in gray boxes on caller concerns. So if you recall the topic clusters of transcripts, there were a range of topics. So we have to make sure we include every type of conversation. So instead of random sampling, we use cluster sampling. Now the transcripts are color coded by topics. So now we can look at a batch of similar transcripts at a time to reduce context switching. But what about the 300 different FAQs? Could we also apply clustering to FAQs? And in fact, we did. We grouped FAQs into categories. So now 300 different FAQs were categorized around into 30 different categories. So if I knew I was dealing with um, a transcript related to race and origin, I could just filter the reference document by the race and origin FAQs. For example, let's look at transcripts about having multiple homes or in the process of moving. I can then look at just at FAQs from the group and ignore the rest of the FAQs. So this, um, with this type of um, process, we were able to label 1,000 calls. So we took 10 examples per topic from an 100 topic model, which yielded 1,000 examples. And with this process, we were able to do the labeled data um, within two to three weeks. So now that we have a labeled data set, we can see where the model is going wrong at an FAQ level or right. The FAQ titled, what if I know the person's race, but not their origin? We saw in our labeled data set, again, again, it's a sample of conversations. We saw about 13 transcripts where we felt this FAQ did best to answer the caller's concern. But the, did the model agree with us? So we got four out of 13 correct, which is about one third. This is typically average um, down to the FAQ level. And remember, we are looking at one out of 300. So that is a much better um, probability. Except when you look at the other um, predictions that the model did, how did I answer the race question? I am blank, but I don't see that on the race question. What do I do? These are not far off. These are all related to race. So only two out of the 13 transcripts were predicted with a non-race origin FAQ, which is pretty good. We see this across the board with our model that it does a much better job predicting the type of FAQ that would be best to use from. This is extremely helpful for the agent. So if the caller wishes to speak to an agent, now they'll have the next best choices to choose from. So here are some takeaways and lessons learned. You can use clustering uh, on survey responses to identify common topics and themes that happen during operations. Cluster sampling the responses and the reference materials greatly improve labeling efficiency and speed for document linkage modeling. We can figure out the best FAQs to answer a caller's question by cosine similarity by semantically linking questions and reference materials through machine learning. We can then provide the agent some prior contacts about the call and the next best FAQ choices. We can understand strengths and shortcomings about among different NLP models uh, or the data itself because of the labeled data set. And then lastly, your model is as good as your data. We realize that we need to dedupe some FAQs where their content was very similar and we need to update language to mirror um, the caller's languages and word set. Thank you. And this is my um, contact information if you have any further questions. So much for your presentation. Does anybody have any questions for Monica? You can put the chat or you can.
Okay, so what we'll do now, I'm just going to open up the floor so all of the presenters can come online. Uh, I'm just going to open up the floor for a couple of minutes of Q and A. I know we're getting right to lunchtime, so we can probably give folks back a little bit of their time to get to lunch. But let me just see if there are any questions for any of our great presenters today. Um, you can go ahead and type questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand to ask and we talk to them directly. Any questions for the folks? Yes, we've got a question for Monica from Michael Snow. For Monica, what service or tool was used um, to transcribe the calls? Uh, we use an open source um, language model called wave to vec All right, any more questions? Going, going. All right, excellent. Is it possible to share? This is here's a question from Elizabeth Nichols. Is it possible to share the smart application? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I can share. Uh, actually, is that something uh, I could share with the when the slides are being shared? Um, yeah, absolutely. You can share that if you send that along to me and to the Fed Kasich folks, we can make sure that that goes out with your slides. Yeah, that's a great question, Elizabeth. And thank you so much, Carolyn. Yep. And just to be uh, the, the smart doc, docs are right now on 1.0, but we're going to be publishing a 3.0. It's going to jump up uh, in just a week or two. So, yes, sit tight, then we'll sit tight and we'll get the 2.0 version. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions while we've got the folks here? All right, great. This one is from Joe. Are there other applications of natural language processing that your agencies are considering for the future? So I think this is a good one for all of you. Um, are there other things that that y'all are kind of working on? What's the next? What's the next thing that you've got your eyes on? I'll jump in and say, um, actually, Elizabeth is going to be presenting at F FCSM. Um, we also, so we did the caller side of like, how do we link the FAQ to the caller? But we also w want to analyze what, what did the agent um, read? So we use um, something called fuzzy matching. So fuzzy matching is very um, popular in um, the natural language space. I don't think it runs as fast as, you know, like matrix math, but it does a pretty good job. Anyone else want to talk about something that's on the horizon? Um, it, in my office, uh, we are putting in some efforts to extract a text information from text information from uh, job descriptions that we receive from our respondents to see if we can um, extract the text and then from there retrieve inform relevant information for our data collection. Very interesting. I'll share one for mine. So over at ETA, one of the things that we're working on is we're looking at some text, raw text that um, grant applicants have entered about the populations that they serve. And so we'd like to do a natural language processing project, kind of look at and see if there's anything that we can kind of glean from that information that they've input. So anything else, anything else that you guys want to share? Well, I mean, I, I guess uh, at over at RTI, uh, well, we're we're all over the place in terms of topics. So I know um, from my from my knowledge, I, I guess I've, we've been using uh, things like that in various like public health, social media research. Um, so I think there's been some papers published about that. Um, just uh, I think we have some internal tools to help people figure out who else in their uh, in RCI has the um, has the experience they're looking for. So so trying to figure out who to contact for for you know, applying for grants and things. Um, it kind of, I guess, I feel like it gets pulled in for, for a whole lot of different um, domains, basically, in our, in our uh, org. Um, I'll keep going through some questions that are coming up through the chat. Are there any, this is from Azriel. are there any R packages that can be used effectively for text embedding? 
and it looks like Monica got back that there are definitely and um, there's a hugging face support in R. That's great. And then you can also do topic modeling in R. Any other thoughts from the panel about R packages that can be used for um, text embedding? That's good. Well, thank you. Thanks, Monica. And then um, any other questions while we're all here? This one is for Caroline and Dirk. So the custom model had 70% accuracy, which I assume is for the top prediction, but the application displays a top five. What is top five accuracy? Right, so, uh, and probably Dirk, Dirk is about to answer the same thing, but the ac we defined accuracy to be the correct response is within the top 5. So that 70% what that meant was that out of the things displayed to the user, 1 of them, 1 of those 5 was the correct label. Um, so we, yeah, that's the 70% is the top 5 accuracy. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions for this great group. All right, many thanks everyone. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I really appreciate your presentation and thanks to everybody in the audience for participating today. It was a great session and we'll get these slides out to everybody um, to everyone shortly. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Emily. Hello, I'm Beth Nichols, and I'm the moderator for the Data Science Applications Text Analysis. Thank you for joining. At this time, all attendees are in listen-only mode. The session is being recorded and will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Attendees can submit written questions using the chat feature, which is at the bottom center or the right side of your WebEx screen. And if you, I liked how Struthers said it earlier, if you're brave enough, you can raise your hand at the end of the sessions and, and we can unmute you and take your questions orally. So we're having, we have four presentations today. Our first presenter unfortunately couldn't make it. So, um, Zachary Smith will um, present Kristen's um, presentation, a semi-automated non-response detector model for open response data. So Zachary. Hi, right, thanks so much. Let me just share my slides. I'm gonna do this one. All right, just confirming everybody can actually see the slides and not um, any notes. Um, okay, so uh, yes, so my, my colleague Kristen, who's the lead author on this paper on um, the development of the SANS model for open uh, response data, um, she submitted an abstract for Fed Kasek and then um, uh, I guess realized she had already scheduled leave to Copenhagen. Um, so. I guess we can decide um, who, who's got it better, me presenting at Fed Kasich or her with her family in, in Denmark. I'll leave it up to you all, um, but let's get started. Um, so we're gonna discuss in this in this presentation kind of the, the development of this uh, item non-response detection model and provide a little background and context for why we did this at the National Center for Health Statistics. Um, and then we're going to evaluate, describe our process of model evaluation, including comparison, um, um, with word count and response latency time, which are two very common metrics I've used for, for identifying item non-response in open-ended text. And you'll notice that there's a little bullet here on a second talk that I'm giving that I'm actually the lead author on later in the panel um, on the use of, 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 of or the assessment of bias in our, in our model. And then we'll co conclude with some um, ideas on, on uh, how to use the model and then I give you some instructions for access. So to start with background and context, this model really emerged out of the COVID-19 pandemic's effect on NCHS's workflow at the Collaborating Center for Questionnaire Design and Evaluation Research, where Kristen and I both uh, work, uh, along with uh, several of our, our co-authors. Um, 
the pandemic brought up a whole host of new COVID-19 related survey items, but our traditional approach of doing in-depth cognitive interviews followed by closed-ended online survey web probes for questionnaire design didn't really work. We the pandemic was moving too quickly and we couldn't do um, in-depth cognitive interviewing until we you know had uh, the ability to do virtual interviews later in 2020. So we adapted and we innovated our methods to include both closed and open-ended probes on our research and development survey, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, so that we but, but that, that created other issues like how what are we going to do with all this open-ended uh, text data? You know, open ends have a, a range of methodological uses. They let respondents uh, offer their thoughts without many constraints, which is really, you know, advantageous when little is known about a topic. But they come with higher response burden um, because respondents have to actually type. Um, they're more prone to item non-response and inadequate and irrelevant responses. And perhaps most crucially for the research team, coding and analyzing open text data is really labor intensive and really time consuming. So we decided we were going to try to leverage some recent advances in data science in collaboration with some data scientists at NCHS, Travis Hoppe and Ben Rogers, who are also part of our co-author team, um, that really offer some new efficiencies and opportunities for the use, uh, for, for helping to analyze this data. At prior work at detecting item non-response has kind of built out of a, a wide variety of categories applied to, um, to open-ended text data. People have talked about non-productive responses, soft and hard refusals, useful and non-useful responses, problematic and valid, sincere versus insincere. So there's been effort at kind of defining what we mean by item non-response in open-ended text. And it looks a little different than simply skipping a question um, in, in a, in a closed-ended format. Um, previous rule-based approach, such as the one by um, uh, the folks at GISAS, uh, Kazmierik, and, and their co-authors um, have categorized with a, with a rule-based approach different open-ended text responses. Um, Etz and co-authors have done a similar thing using Excel VBA macros. And there has been a recent effort at using machine learning by Young and Fernandez to detect invalid responses, they use a, a bag of words approach, which I'll get to in a minute and how it differs from ours. What we found is that these approaches have some limitations. Um, I think you'll all be familiar with the fact that the, the, the rule-based um, approaches are limited by the rules that they, uh, that they use. They rely on regular expressions. They miss some um, gibberish and don't know responses. This is, these are examples from eval answers where uh, eval answer missed these um, uh, likely non-codable non-responses. Uh, they flag some single word responses that we probably would want to treat as valid in some contexts. They flag valid responses that are quite long, but that include one of the rules. In other words, there are a lot of issues with, with rule-based approaches in um, generating both false positives and false negatives. And, the, and by contrast, the other machine learning approach that's up there, and this one by Young and Fernandez, works really well on lengthier and cleaner pieces of text. They used it on um, on like uh, diary entries, um, autobiographical memory texts, um, but their model requires substantial pre-processing of the data and a project-specific training set, which entails substantial human coding. So what do we offer that's different? We um, developed a model called um, SANS, a semi-automated non-response detection for surveys um, based off of, uh, it's, it's a play on our RANS research and development surveys at NCHS, so we have RANS and SANS. Um, it's a trained natural language processing model built off of uh, BERT and uh, using simple contrastive sentence embedding. I have to say, I only play a data scientist um, part of the time, so a lot of this is not stuff that is, uh, you know, really part of my, my skill set. I come to this from the survey methodology uh, side of things, but I, I'm happy to talk about this um, as necessary and also refer you to our data scientist co-authors if you have more uh, questions on how the model was, uh, like the intricacies of the model training. We refined this model with um, human coding uh, with a training set um, where we coded a bunch of open-ended responses using this working taxonomy. Uh, and you might look at this and say, oh, this looks a lot like eval answer. And it is indeed inspired by the eval answer taxonomy. It doesn't use all the categories, but it uses many of them. And the model SANS assigns a score from zero to one for the extent to which a response falls into each of the item non-response categories or valid. 
Um, so in our development, we uh, coded 1,400 responses, uh, each five researchers, uh, two groups of 600 responses coded by pairs, and 200 responses that all five of us coded. We had reasonably good consistency. We generally um, identified, I, the model identified item non-response well, but it flagged too many valids as item non-response. Um, so um, my colleague Kristen and I uh, went back, reviewed, and arbitrated the training set. And you know, we found that many uh, uh, items in the training set had uh, different codes applied by different um, humans. And that, that's expected to some degree because the determination of item non-response, especially the subcategory of item non-response, is an inherently subjective endeavor. So we arbitrated, we removed uncertainty where we felt it was warranty and we warranted and we retained it where we felt um, a, a human might make a reasonable um, determination that a, a response could fall into one category or another whether that's one of the categories of non-response or between one of the categories and valid. Okay, so how do we evaluate SANS? We developed it through this coding and um, arbitration process. What do we do? So we, um, we evaluated it on, on some data from the NCHS Research and Development Survey um, from three rounds that we conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the topics focused on, uh, on health and uh, pandemic-related behaviors and opinions. I was conducted using NORC, and the data I'm going to talk about uh, today come from round three, which was fielded in May through June of 2021. You've got the whole um, uh, details on the sample there. It was a, a probability sample with an error speak. Um, these were the probes that we used for our evaluation. Um, the first uh, uh, probes um, came from, uh, actually, I, I shouldn't say that we were only looking at round three data. The first um, uh, probes came from rounds one and round round one only. Um, the, the coronavirus pandemic uh, time reference probe, why do people say that the pandemic began or first affected their life at a certain time, a probe on quarantine, a probe on general vaccine hesitancy, social distancing, and religion. The way that we developed our and evaluated our model is presented in this uh, in this chart. And um, what we're going to talk about today are the phases two, three, four, and five. So two, we, we analyzed four um, web probes, one from round one and one from um, rounds, uh, or three from round uh, three of the rounds during COVID-19. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. The next talk is going to cover our efforts at discussing model or identifying model bias. And then I'm going to show you in this presentation some comparisons with existing measures of item non-response or um, thresholds for identifying item non-response with word count and response latency. In phase one of our evaluation, just to quickly identify what we did at, at, that also informed some development, we, we've previously presented this work at APOR. We looked at the quarantine probe and the pandemic time reference probe with an earlier iteration of the model. Um, and there were some outstanding issues with this where um, the model identified uh, the word none as uh, valid, which we were really confused by until we realized that part of the training set included a probe, list the ways the coronavirus pandemic has affected your life, which our coding team naturally said, well, none is totally valid for that. And so uh, we'll, I'll get into how to kind of use SANS and understand the limitations of, of SANS um, uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so we retrained the model um, to kind of correct for this issue, to move none more strongly to refusal, and carried out a phase two um, evaluation of the quarantine, social distancing, vaccine hesitancy, and religion probes. The social distancing survey question I already put um, up on the, on the screen, but it was like, in the last week, did you socially distance when you were doing a variety of these activities? And if yes, did you do them inside, outside, or both? And then we ask you, when you were answering about those questions, what were you thinking about? So we used sensitivity and specificity, which are common um, evaluations of, of accuracy um, seen in the medical sciences, to evaluate the, the performance of SAMs. And uh, sensitivity, very briefly, is the proportion of responses identified by the model as uh, passing a test, or in this case, identify this item non-response out of all the true non-responses um, in, in the world, uh, or at least in the population of that, um, of that probe. Um, and conversely, specificity is the, per, is the proportion of true negatives identified by the, uh, the model, in this case, true valids, something that is not identified as non-response, um, out of all the, all the true negatives in the probe. 
So um, just to go through some of these, I, I could have noted the animations, but just to show you some of the false valids that we found, some of the things where um, the humans, re when reviewing the, um, this, uh, this probe, identified as non-response, you see things like recent activity or everything or being normal. These are things that are really hard for a person to qualitatively code or to tell us something meaningful about, um, about the, the, the topic. Um, whereas if you look at some of the false non-responses, some things that the model thought were was non-response, but humans upon review determined were valid, things like safety, which we can look at and say, oh, that's safety, that might make sense for social distancing, or um, lines in the market, or it's common courtesy, which we can identify as probably being courtesy, and it was a an error in either the typing of the respondent or of the, the telephone interviewers. Some of our respondents were interviewed over the telephone. And this led to sensitivity of 81%, which is pretty darn good, um, and specificity of 96%, which is really good. In other words, this model does a very good job um, at identifying true valids, slightly less well as identifying true item non-response. And I'll note where the model tends to miss a little bit later, which helps you hopefully use this model in your work. So I mentioned we had three other probes that we looked at. Here's vaccine hesitancy, religion, and quarantine. And what you can see is that our sensitivity and specificity are kind of in that same range for all of them. We've got 90% specificity on vaccine hesitancy, 95% on quarantine. One thing that I'll note is that the, um, the direction is inverted for religion. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is and um, what we think that means for, for SANS um, going forward um, in a little bit. First of all, the religion probe um, identified a pretty large share of model coded um, uh, non response. Baseline rates of item non response are estimated at like 10 to 20%. But the share in religion, just looking crudely at like, did the model identify as response as non response or as valid, was much higher than, uh, than anticipated. And this is eliminating even blank responses. So it's really only looking at like text that, that's there. That tells you that the model is probably. Um, having some difficulty with this kind of text. It doesn't know what non-response looks like in that context, um, and it, it, it's, having, it's having an issue. And I mentioned that the model, like, you know, it, it, it's not as sensitive as it is specific, that is, it's not as good at identifying true non-responses as it is at identifying true valid responses. And um, what you can see is that, in general, the model misses in the so-called high-risk category. And these are responses like, everything or I'm tired and I want to go to bed, where um, you might have a hard time coding this data, um, but I, the, the model uh, is not certain whether it's valid or whether it is, uh, is non-codable. What we've thought about with the high risk group is, or the high risk categorizations, that this really is a measure of low quality um, responses that might be valid or invalid depending on context. And so we recommend that you review this high risk category, whatever SANS outputs on your data. You'll notice that there are some other kind of um, interesting takeaways here. In the vaccine hesitancy probe, we saw a much higher identification of uncertainty. And that's because we got people saying things like, I don't know, I just want to make sure that it's safe. Well, that's probably codable, but they started with I don't know. And for SANS, despite that there was no rule um, that, that made it look at I don't know and say we have to call it unsure, that it identified the response as more unsure than valid. Um, in the religion probe, you wouldn't know this until you go in and, and look at everything, but there are issues here where the religion probe identified a lot, SANS identified a lot of responses as refusal and as high risk, which is indicative of, of um, some error that you already would have probably predicted by looking at the overall distribution of non-response. And I mentioned I was going to compare to our word count um, thresholds and response latency. So just to quickly kind of go through this, um, there are other metrics out in the literature for evaluating um, uh, or for predicting item non-response from open-ended text. Some people say, well, I'm just going to drop all one-word responses. That's the eval answer approach. Then some people say, well, it's really character count, 6, 16, 51 characters. They're all arbitrary thresholds. And what you can see is that compared to SANS, we get different levels of a kind of missing. Um, the one word threshold identifies a lot of uh, responses as valid that SANS looking at it might say, oh, actually this is not codable. This is not a, this is not type, a type of response. 
Um, whereas the like 51 character threshold identifies a lot of responses as non-response that SAN says, hey, actually you can get something, we think you can get something codable and useful out of it. This is a similar thing happens with response latency. Some people say, you know, you should, uh, two seconds or less that's like speeding it's not good no maybe it's actually three seconds or less maybe it's the half mean response time and all of these kind of perform differently than than sans uh the two seconds or less response you know it identifies um, a lot of non-responses but it misses a bunch of non-responses that take respondents a lot longer uh, than two seconds to to, uh, to complete the same for the three seconds or less and the half mean response time kind of does the inverse where um, there are respondents who are like real quick with their fingers on their smartphone or, or their fingers on their uh, their keyboard, and they're able to get a valid codable response um, in, in a pretty quick time frame that would not be predicted by that, uh, or would not be caught by that metric. So overall, we think that our evaluation results indicate that SANS performs very well in identifying a data set of likely valid results, and it also appears to capture item non-response and valid responses with much more nuance than these rule-based approaches that um, we identified. So just to sum up um, and talk a little bit about how you can use and find SANS. It's currently available for general use on Hugging Face on the NCHS um, uh, page. You can uh, use it via the Hugging Face API or Python with the Transformers library. We have a model card available with examples. Some knowledge of Python is needed to run it, but it's not the most complicated thing in the world. And there's more information on NCHS's site as well. So when you're using SAMS, though, we in our evaluation process, we identified several kind of best practices that we recommend you follow. First of all, we recommend that you pre-process hard-coded non-responses and blank responses, which SAMS is not really easily able to detect. Uh, for example, NORC in, in um, the data that they provide to NCHS for the RANS identifies web skips as 98, and SANS thinks that 98 is, uh, I think it thinks that it's actually valid, um, but we know it's not valid, we know it means blank. And so we recommend that you just like pre-process those and remove them from, um, from the corpus that's being evaluated by SANS. But that's really only the, the only pre-processing you need to do, otherwise it's ready off the shelf. We think that you should look at the rate of non-response that the model detects, as I identified with the, the religion probe. Um, if you see rates of non-response that are much higher than um, a, a typical baseline would project of 10 to 20 percent, we recommend that you just look at all those non-responses and recognize that the model may have not performed as well in your corpus. We also recommend that you always review so-called other high-risk responses where we see the highest proportion of, of model um, error. Uh, of, of identification of, uh, of false positives. And we recommend that you consider the construct that's captured by the probe. In the case of vaccine hesitancy, for example, um, it made sense that we saw many more responses flagged as unsure because uncertainty was a valid response to, um, to hesitancy uh, in, in, in some ways. And in our evaluation efforts, one thing that we did was randomly sample the valid responses, look at like a thousand of them, and um, kind of scroll through them and, and code them quickly and identify where we think that the model might have missed, um, which is how we came to those some of those um, specificity calculations. We've now um, um, fully coded the round three data, but in earlier uh, presentations, we showed um, a, an extrapolation from that random sample. We think that that's a good practice for you to, um, to, to identify that the model is indeed performing well at defining or at identifying likely valids, and it isn't as burdensome as looking at the entire corpus of your data. You can look at a random sample. Um, I mentioned a little bit about some of these limitations already. Um, SANS reflects biases inherent in the parent training data, and it may not perform as well on non-health related topics, such as, for example, religion, which might be its own special thing or continuing evaluation efforts um, to try to pin this down. Um, so, uh, just to, to, to kind of conclude, uh, we really look forward to learning more about SANS's generalizability to other domains as other researchers apply it to their data, and uh, we hope to evaluate the broader utility of open text response data using this as one of our uh, tools in our toolkit. With that, I want to thank you so much. Uh, thank my co-authors as well for all the work that they put into this project. Please feel free to contact us with any questions. Travis on this slide is our data science, uh, Associate Director for Data Science at uh, NCHS. He's our uh, go-to person for data science questions. 
Um, feel free to contact any of us though with questions about the model. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Zachary. It was very interesting. I'll let you go on a little bit longer than the 15 minutes, but that's okay. I, I learned quite a bit. Our, our next speaker is Stuart Jollymore. He's a senior data scientist with the Defense Personnel Analytics Center, where he leads efforts of qualitative survey analysis using modern NLP techniques. He has a passion for mathematics and machine learning and enjoys bringing these to bear in his work. Outside of this, he's an avid rock climber and an accomplished ultra marathoner. So Stuart, looking forward to hearing from you. Awesome, thank you for that great introduction. Um, hello, as noted, I'm Stuart Jollymore with the Defense Personnel Analytics Center, formerly known as uh, OPA, the Office of People Analytics. We actually merged with the Office of the Actuary to become DPAC. Um, a lot of the bread and butter of what we do is personnel research. Um, we rely on a number of a large number of in-house surveys um, that we uh, develop, field, and ingest for analysis. Um, some of them are congressionally mandated. Other ones are um, done by are, are sponsored by some of our stakeholders across the DoD and under the, um, the Office of Personnel, the Under Secretary of uh, Defense for Personnel and Readiness. Uh, so I work with a lot of research psychologists, psychometricians. Um, social science analysts and uh, math and survey statisticians um, fielding a lot of these surveys. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. Um, and uh, just give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the objective that we had setting out with this project is um, as we move to a cloud based uh, analytics enclave. Um, we wanted to kind of kick the tires and what better way to do that than um, try to build a, a natural language processing platform to um, analyze the vast amount of text, um, open, open ended text responses we get from our numerous surveys. Right? So our um, cloud based system is called is branded Advana. Um, it's an AWS system uh, that features uh, Databricks integration. Uh, AWS cloud computing and AWS uh, data storage. The areas that I'm going to be talking about today are uh, topic modeling and sentiment, sentiment analysis. Um, usually what we kind of think about when we look at our open ended text responses is we kind of want to know what um, what people are saying um, and that's like topics or thematic uh, analysis and then how are they saying it? And that's kind of the sentiment analysis uh, portion of that. So our approach was to um, leverage uh, some transformer technology. Um, Zachary did a great job kind of discussing um, some of the transformer technology that they were working with. So all of our, uh, the work we've done so far is BERT related, uh, either direct BERT models or sentence transformers, which are Kind of a spinoff of BERT. Um, I should note that this is not a primer in transformer technology per se. Um, I'm really trying to showcase the kinds of things we're doing in building a platform to analyze open ended text, right? So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details about uh, BERT, uh, transformer technology in general. Um, or sentence transformer technology, right? So there's lots of great papers out there. I think uh, attention is all you need is a really good paper for people to kind of start getting into what like BERT models are and what transformers are generally speaking. Um, so so you can check that 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 paper out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A little bit about our platform. Uh, I talked a little bit about this already, but our platform is branded Advana. Um, DPAC's specific enclave is called Beacon. So a lot of different organizations have their own enclaves within the Advana space. Um, but Advana uh, is derived from advancing analytics. Uh, and, and as I said, this is a, a cloud-based analytics platform 
that host a variety of tools and um, analysis resources that allow us to democratize data, democratize tools, um, share and work uh, in a collaborative environment that's able to uh, help us get uh, solve all, all of our uh, use cases. Um, some of the tools that we use are, uh, like I mentioned before, Databricks. Um, I'm running Databricks Runtime 10.4. Um, this has like all the machine learning stuff kind of built into it. It's a notebook coding scheme. So it's kind of like Jupyter, but uh, Databricks has its own notebook, you know, um, software. But it's, 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 it's basically runs like Jupyter. Um, and then for our model registry, and model development, we leverage ML flow uh, for our ML ops. Um, we also running Python uh, 3.9 and some of the top shelf libraries that we used for the analysis I'll talk about today are transformers, PyTorch, uh, sentence transformers, BERT topic and scikit-learn. So getting right into it, right? So topic modeling, um, why did we choose? So DPAC has done a number of topic modeling qualitative research projects uh, over the years. And traditionally, we've used um, some of the maybe old school LDA type models that exist out there. Um, and why did we want to move away from this? Well, we have two like reasons for this. When building out the platform, we're really interested in kind of streamlining, stream, streamlining pre processing. Anyone that's built a number of different LDA models for different use cases knows that um, pre-processing for these types of models is not the same, right? Each go around here, you have custom stop words, you're doing limitization or uh, word stemming or, you know, TDIF, uh, TFIDF uh, inputs, bag of word uh, models uh, as inputs. So there's like a lot of ways to kind of, um, build these things up. So it's not really a, a hugely streamlined uh, process uh, that's kind of a one size fits all. Uh, and another limitation to the LDA models is they actually produce lower coherence scores. Um, so in, in this case, um, we're talking about um, uh, normalized pointwise mutual information uh, as, as a coherence score. And, and I'll discuss some of the other metrics that do exist that people use to kind of choose the right number of topics. So what are we replacing these traditional LDA models with? Well, um, Mar uh, Martin Grutendorf um, is a research psychologist turned data scientist. Um, we, would, we would love to have someone like that with us because um, we have a lot of data scientists and research psychologists. So uh, uh, folks like him would uh, be great fits. But what he did was he set out to um, build a modular uh, platform or uh, library for topic modeling um, that's based on um, sentence transformers uh, and uh, uh, various clustering algorithms. So um, here you see uh, a graphic from his website and um, the process goes, you embed your documents, you reduce the dimensionality, you cluster them, and then you start developing your topic representations using the tokenizer, uh, class-based TFIDF, um, and then uh, optional fine-tuning for uh, topic representations, which I'll discuss a little bit in the future work section of this presentation. Um, so what did we use? We used the mini LM uh, model, uh, sentence transformer model from the Hugging Face repository. This is, um, a sentence transformer model that was um, built on the MPNet data set. Um, and it's a lightweight version of the MPNet uh, base model, uh, which is considerably larger and runs a little bit slower. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about our Advana uh, environment is that we have both CPU and GPU clusters. Um, none of the work that I did, I, uh, none of the models I trained did I train on GPUs. Um, as we're kind of kicking the tires, we we decided to keep the spot cost low and um, trained all, all of our models on CPUs. So using the smaller, more lightweight model um, was very useful uh, in that case. So um, for testing, that's what we did. It's, you know, embeds documents much quicker. 
um, and has uh, reasonable uh, accuracy as far as um, what it can produce. So it's very close to the large model. It's just a lot more lightweight, kind of like the relationship between BERT and distill BERT, which is about half, um, half the hidden layers of the full BERT model. Okay, so along with um, the fact that we're using sentence transformers to do embeddings of um, our documents, um, BERT topic comes uh, with two kind of flavors that we can spin off of a global, a global uh, topic model, right? And those are hierarchical topic modeling and dynamic topic modeling. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, both of those and how they kind of can work also work together uh, to, to build a uh, more robust uh, heuristics for uh, um, themes, right? So for a hierarchical topic modeling, basically what we do is we build a very large topic model that consists of uh, very localized topics. So we're setting our number of topics to be considerably larger than you might see in an LDA model. So um, we're talking, you know, 100, 200 different uh, like um, topics um, that, that we're creating from the beginning. And then what we do is we use a hierarchical linkage function that allows us to, um, in, a, in, a, in a two by two process, um, collapse, basically collapse uh, topics um, that are most similar, right? So uh, the, you know, the bottom layer, we're, we're collapsing on each topic with the topic that is most closely related to it. Um, into a new topic, and then we repeat the process until we have only one umbrella topic left, right? So that's the hierarchical nature of this. Um, I took a little screen grab of the tree that uh, is part of the output from BERT topic, and it shows kind of what this looks like using the topic representations. Uh, and these are the top words um, that, that come from each topic, right? So we have two, um, uh, local or we have three local topics right we have topic one topic six and topic two right and these um the way the hierarchical linkage works is that it it um, basically compares the embeddings of the topic representations and um collapses those that are the that are most similar so one and six were collapsed into um an umbrella uh topic that's uh, BAH, which is base housing, ba it's a basically a ba base housing allowance, um, housing costs, uh, living, cost of living, and pay, right? Um, and then we see in the next layer up, it's collapsing that collapsed topic with topic two, which is an original topic from the, uh, um, like the 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 original large model, right? And so it repeats this process over and over. So why is this nice? Well, um, BERT topic has its own API for manually um, collapsing these. So the 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 tree gives us a good sense of like what it looks like, right? And it maintains all of these connections, um, but it doesn't actually do the collapsing. If we want to go ahead and merge topics, we can use the BERT topic uh, topics to merge uh, API um, that allows us to choose which topics we think that we want to uh, merge um, so that we can do it heuristically. And that's kind of like the human in the loop uh, portion of that, which is very useful. So that's hierarchical topic modeling. It really allows us to see how topics relate to one another. Um, so moving on. I'll talk a little bit about uh, dynamic topic modeling. Um, and again, these, these words and phrases are um, come from uh, Grutendorf himself, right? So these are kind of the names that he gave it. So dynamic topic modeling is kind of a way of looking about, uh, looking at how topics evolve over time. Um, and this is really important for um, organizations like us who, you know, do the same surveys, you know, you know, every couple of years we're, we're, we're always putting out the same surveys. So we have a big interest in seeing what kind of themes 
are, are on the rise, which kind of themes are, are, are kind of petering out and how these things change over time. So dynamic topic modeling basically takes the globalized topic model, breaks it up into um, time steps, recalculates the topic representations, and then gives us a couple options of how we can see those, uh, how those topics um, evolve over time, both in their representations and also in their frequencies, right? So uh, this is really uh, a, a good lesson um, and, and allows us to kind of track how themes change over time. So if there's a policy change, we may see a jump or a diminishment of a certain topic. Um, and and that's, that, that's like really useful information for our policy offices who uh, make up a, a bulk of our, um, uh, stakeholders, right? Um, so one thing I want to point out is that if you look at our topics over time plot, we see that topics um, two or uh, excuse me, topics one and six, they follow the same kind of trajectory over time, right? And if you remember, if you go back a slide, we saw that we actually found that topics one and topic six were collapsed in the first layer of the hierarchical topic modeling. And this actually shows that the way they're talked about actually moves together, right? Um, all three of these topics were, were chosen, um, are, are all increasing in the frequency of, of how they're discussed over time. But we definitely see that there is um, a, a, like, a shallower slope or like a smaller increase between 2016 and 2017 for topics um, one and six than what we see during the same period of time for topic two, right? So this is another way to kind of see if our if we are collapsing topics in the in in an appropriate way, right? Um, and and I, I had mentioned how that these two processes can kind of work in tandem. Now the uh, when you model the when you create the uh, dynamic topic model, right? You you don't plot all of them all at once. If you have a hundred you know lines, you're not really going to see anything. So this really what we really like to do is is grab some of the topics that we have interest in that may be related to a um, uh, a research question that we have, um, and then and then plot those over time, right? Now, now all the all the calculations are are all done simultaneously, right? But it's just the plotting where we kind of reduce it to those uh, topics of interest. So that's kind of um, the what are people saying. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use transformer technology to talk um, to kind of investigate how people are saying what they are saying, right? And that's sentiment modeling. Um, we'll our have project, about three minutes left. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, our, our model, we used, uh, 30,000 hand label comments. Um, we collapsed a five scale liker, um, sentiment score into a binary, um, to, to handle class imbalance that we found. Um, this gave us about a 60, 40, um, split of uh, balance for negative and non-negative. Um, we also ran some baseline models, a linear and a naive Bayes classifier. Um, and then our uh, BERT model that we used is a fine-tuned checkpoint from Hugging Face that was fine-tuned on the uh, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank for binary sentiment. Uh, and that is the two in SST2. Um, what we see is that um, our uh, metric of choice, F1, uh, is considerably higher and about is on the precipice of a very good F1 score for language models at 80, uh, 0.87. Uh, and it definitely outperformed both the linear and the naive Bayes. Uh, again, we even though we have class imbalance, we did put in accuracy to um, for added uh, comparative insights here, right? So the BERT model, right, has seen lots and lots of language before where the linear and the naive Bayes models have not. 
um, and we would expect that uh, these uh, scores would go up considerably with uh, more data, right? Uh, it is worth notice, uh, noting that we ran some of the similar baseline models and some more sophisticated gradient boosted models on the same 30,000 comments um, and using uh, NLP uh, libraries from R and uh, those results are in the appendix, right? So where is the future work going? Uh, we're looking to leverage GPT technology, right? So taking GPT Neo X, which is about a 12 billion parameter large language model, fine tuning that on our domain uh, knowledge to help us build better, more human readable topic representations. I did a screen grab of a play of the OpenAI playground uh, where I did this, where I took the top words from a um, bird topic model and asked uh, the Da Vinci GPT model to, um, excuse me, give us a human, uh, like a short phrase definition of the topic, right? Um, uh, Advana is kind of behind the, uh, behind the curtain, right? It's not connected to the internet. So OpenAI's uh, API for bird topic does not work for us. Uh, if you have a more open enclave or research environment, you may be able to just use Bird Topics OpenAI um, API uh, to to do this automatically. So it's fully integrated at this point in the in, in the most recent version. And then the last thing I'll say is um, we are looking to build some NER models um, using some spacey models. We have a huge uh, rich source of um, training data to uh, do automatic PII redaction. Um, so there is a transformer uh, based NER model from um, Spacey, which we do have. We just haven't gotten um, the, the the model up and running yet. So we're we're still collating some of our um, training data right now. But we have a lot of it, and uh, we think we should be doing pretty good. In summary. Right, we're we're moving to the you know to more towards cutting edge technologies. Uh, we're using transformers for topic modeling for sentiment analysis. We're going to be using it for NER to redact PII um, and and a lot of other fun great stuff. Here are some resources and the appendix. And these sh uh, slides should be posted on the Fedcastic website uh, after today. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. That was, that was excellent. You all are doing a lot of a lot of work, and I do have some questions for you. But we're going to move on to our next speaker. So we're going to bring Zachary back, and this time he's going to present his own uh, presentation. Um, Zachary Smith is a behavioral scientist at the National Center for Health Statistics Collaborating Center for Questionnaire Design and Evaluation Research. At NCHS, he leads cognitive interviewing studies conducts mixed method evaluations using the NCHS Research and Development Survey and develops methodology, methodological interventions to enhance the quality of qualitative data. His title is Sociodemographic and Methodological Subgroup Correlates of Item Non-Response to Open-Ended Web Probes. So, Zachary, we look forward to hearing, hearing you again. Thank you. Right, thank you so much for that kind introduction. As Beth said, this is actually my lead presentation now, so I look forward to um, to sharing this with you after you've already had so much context on um, on SANS, which forms uh, the the backbone of this presentation as well. And uh, I want to thank my co-author team um, here as well, which also includes Paul Scanlon, who um, has done quite a bit of work at NCHS in kind of clarifying the. Uh, the agenda and the research use of open-ended and closed-ended web probes. So in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges for using open-ended text data and how we, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we detect and remove item non-response in a corpus of open-ended text data using our SANS model. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to focus very specifically on how we assess the SANS model for bias. Does it distinguish responses? Is it equally sensitive and specific across different methodological um, and, uh, and demographic subgroups? And also then use the context of that analysis to inform the distribution of non-response. We have this model. Now, who are the people who are not responding? What implications does that have for question evaluation? 
So uh, I'll kind of speed through this because you already heard me talk about it, right? We have a, uh, there's a lot of challenges in working with open-ended data um, that I went through. And, and part of the question with working with open-ended data is like, is it even worth it if the data are junk anyway? Like what is the use of this open-ended text data? Um, to, to work with open-ended text data, you have to at minimum try to figure out how to get like some of the stuff that you can't code out of it. And that's where our SANS model comes in. Um, you, that I talked about at the beginning of this session. Um, our prior work uh, has uh, has kind of leveraged these advances in data science to build this ac more accurate detector of item non-response. Um, and we do that with high sensitivity and specificity as um, I talked about at the beginning of this session. So in this presentation, we'll look at um, NCHS's Research and Development Survey RANS during COVID-19. I gave you a little context about that before. It was a three-round survey um, conducted over the web um, in self-administered format with some respondents completing over the phone, over a telephone interview. Um, it used um, NORC at the University of Chicago's Amerispeak panel. That's a probability-based panel. Uh, rounds one and two had the non-probability Dagnata panel to supplement. And there's some details on these uh, on the rounds um, in the table below. The first two rounds were in summer 2020. The third round was in um, late spring to early summer 2021. Here are the probes that we're going to be looking at in this presentation. The first is this pandemic time reference that I mentioned earlier. Um, the why do you say that? Why do you say that the coronavirus pandemic first affected your daily life at this time or began at this time? Um, what were you thinking about when answering the question about quarantine? List the ways the coronavirus pandemic has affected your life. Do you suspect that you have ever had the coronavirus or COVID-19? And then why do you believe this is the probe? Um, and again, list the ways the coronavirus pandemic has affected your life was included on round two. And in round three, um, these probes about vaccine hesitancy, social distancing, and religion that I talked about um, in the previous presentation. Okay. So a concern that we had with SANS is whether it performed differently by sociodemographic and methodological subgroup. We know that the model is, broadly speaking, sensitive and specific at a level that we feel comfortable about, that we think is better than existing rule-based and other machine learning approaches. But you know, is it equally sensitive and specific for different groups? Because uh, we know that natural language processing models can perpetuate biases that are in the training set corpora. And that can lead to, um, to harmful effects on, on data quality um, if we're improperly excluding um, some respondents' uh, words more than others. Um, to assess model bias, we conducted two-tailed z-tests across groups for sensitivity and specificity, and we used Cohen's H to quantify the magnitude of differences. Because this data includes some non-probability sample data, our generalization is fairly limited. It really describes the, the, the world of the, the bias evaluation data set um, because we, we aren't um, accounting for the non-probability samples uh, uh, inclusion in the data. Um, so we use these four probes, the quarantine probe, the vaccine hesitancy probe, the social distancing probe, and the religion probes. Um, and there were was differential model performance overall in these probes. For example, the social distancing probe, the SANS did quite well. And the religion probe, SANS was better at a, a, a better a detector of item non-response and a worse detector of valid responses than it was in the other probes. Um, here are some of the, like, broad, uh, these are the statistically significant findings anyway. So um, the model had differences in in sensitivity, statistically significant differences in sensitivity. It was, it had higher sensitivity for respondents who completed the survey via landline telephone than it did for respondents who completed the survey via smartphone or computer. That is, it was better at detecting non-response for the landline telephone respondents than for the smartphone or computer respondents. And Cohen's H is 0.25, which is like small to medium in, in terms of size. Um, conversely, it was uh, better at uh, detecting, um, uh, it, was, it was a more specific model among respondents who completed over the smartphone computer and a less specific model for um, respondents who completed over landline telephone. Uh, the Cohen's H is 0.16, which is small, um, this sort of trade-off between sensitivity and specificity is expected and understood. So when we see differences in one, it makes sense that we see differences in the other, especially considering that the difference in sensitivity was small to medium, it was substantively a little bit higher. 
Um, the model also performed better at detecting valid responses. Um, that is, it was more specific among respondents with a BA versus less than BA, and among non-Hispanic white respondents than non-Hispanic black respondents, and among non-Hispanic all other respondents, um, not that is non non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic uh, than non-Hispanic black. But I mentioned H of 0.16 is a small effect size, so is 0.11, so is 0.17, so is 0.14, and there were no other differences that were statistically significant. In other words, the uh, while we found statistically significant results, the substantive effect of these results was relatively small, with the exception of survey response mode, where they were uh, the effect was small to medium. And to zero in on survey response mode, our previous evaluation work um, in, uh, in a publication that we hope is forthcoming that details our evaluative process found some different results. When we zoomed in at just the quarantine probe only, we found higher sensitivity for those completing online than over the phone. But in the larger data set that we examined in, uh, in that paper, which included a random sample of a thousand valid responses for each probe instead of the full corpus of of responses, which is what I presented here. We found results that looked like what we presented here, and we, we really didn't know what to do with that. Um, there are some potential challenges for telephone-based interviewing in SANS. Because interviewers do not always directly transcribe, there are often significant spelling or grammatical errors, and there's limited training on responses from landline telephone respondents in our training set. We're not quite sure how well SANS performs on, on that. Um, on that model, even though it says that it performs better at identifying non response here, we're a little, uh, we're, we're not certain that it's um, doing um, everything that we want it to. And so, consequently, in the subsequent analysis of the distribution of non response, we just decided to remove mode as a variable entirely and look at the other variables where we felt like we had a better sense of what was going on. Okay, the model is sensitive, it's specific. I talked to you about that earlier, I mentioned it even this in this presentation. Um, it performs reasonably equally across groups, and where it doesn't perform equally, the effect sizes are small. So given all of this, what methodological or demographic subgroups are correlated with either non-response? For this, we pulled all the data together, and I'm going to like show you a bunch of forest plots here. Right? The logis we ran logistic regressions to estimate odds of non-response by subgroup for seven probes across three rounds of RAND during COVID-19. Here are the reference categories for the um, for the probes, age 18 to 29, gender male, and the interaction of race, ethnicity, and education kind of get at that intersection of race and class is non-Hispanic white and uh, less than BA. The forest plots show 95% confidence intervals. The analyses were run in R and R Studio using Tidyverse and SJPlot. Um, and we present it for results for the full probability and non-probability sample where appropriate for some probes. And then we also restrict it to just show you the probability based Amerispeak only subsample. All right, get ready. There's a lot of forest plots coming. So we have the pandemic time reference probe. One thing that I think shows up here is the effect of panel, right? The uh, Dynata respondents are uh, the odds of their uh, response being identified as non-response is substantially higher um, than Amerispeak respondents. We know from the literature that the data quality of non-probability panels is generally worse than probability samples, and we see some real clear effects of that in the quality of the open uh, text responses. Um, another interesting and predictable finding from the literature here is that the uh, odds of, of non-response decline with, um, with age. Um, the small effect sizes are pretty visible here, but the, um, the, there's significant declining odds. Um, the, Interaction of race and class that we performed here shows that education mostly washes out the observed correlation um, of race uh, within the non Hispanic white group that higher education is associated with lower odds of predicted non response within the low education group non Hispanic black and Hispanic. Uh, associated with uh, higher odds of predicted non response and all others are not significant and I want to draw your attention to the Nagel Kirk pseudo R squared of 0.1. I'm going to come back to this, and you'll see it on some of these other slides. Here's the quarantine probe. If you didn't notice that the slide changed, it's because the results look pretty similar. It's also the case for the, sus the suspicion of COVID-19 probe and for the disruption to, um, to your life because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our N is substantially largest, larger here because we had two rounds to work with, and it has the tightest confidence intervals. Um, it does show um, 
roughly the same um, relationship with the additional finding that for non-white people of any race or ethnic group at lower education levels, the odds of non-response are higher um, than the non-Hispanic white um, uh, low education group. Um, here's the pandemic probe for just the probability-based sample only. Everything kind of looks, you know, the directionality looks fairly similar. The, the effects look fairly similar for all of these. If we get to just the vaccine hesitancy probe, things still look fairly similar. We didn't use the Dynata opt-in, so it's all Amerispeak. The panel variable is not there. Same effects. Same is true for social distancing and even religion, where we saw kind of different results in sensitivity and specificity, the directionality sort of looks the same. So you might say, wow, you showed me a lot of forest plots. Well, I wish I could like actually see that overlap and not just take your word for it. Well, here it is. This is the rounds one and two probes, which include the Dynata sample. You can see that kind of the, um, in general, the, st the effects of the statistically significant effects are um, similar for all probes. Um, it's not true for, for everything because of the larger sample for um, the disruption probe. Um, if you look just at the probability-based sample, again, the point estimates kind of cluster around each other. And the same is true for the round three probes looking at the probability-based sample only. So I mentioned the Nagel-Kirk pseudo R squared, and I'm just gonna point out that the models don't fit particularly well, right? The model fit is actually higher for models that include this panel variable, which suggests kind of happily for us that demographic subgroups may not be good predictors of item non-response. If we think that SAMS is a good detector of item non-response, it's nice to know that um, your race or ethnicity or even your education, your age are not like the greatest predictors of item non-response out there. In fact, I don't have results that I can show you here, but um, things like character count of your response or word count or time that a uh, respondent spends on a question are much more um, uh, predictive of, of uh, item non-response uh, in SANS than, um, than these, uh, uh, these socio-demographic and methodological subgroups. So what are the implications for our question evaluation? We think that SANS speedily categorizes open text data with reasonable sensitivity and specificity. It offers a clear, and I think this analysis offers a clear understanding of the demographics of non-responders, which offers some insight into patterns of non-response that can help us improve question design. Even if we think that the, the model fit is small, the effects are still there and we can know um, that, we, that we need to pay particular attention to responses that are categorized as non-response among um, younger respondents to make sure that we're not um, unfairly excluding some of our data. We think that this is generally good uh, for use of open text data for the reasons that I just outlined, that these demographic subgroups are only weakly predictive of item non-response, and that lessens the risk of the of inequitable data that would be used to design um, future questions. Again, SANS, available on Hugging Face, more information on NCHS's website. I just want to thank everybody um, for your time and your indulgence in talking, me talking twice today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Zachary. It was, it was really good. So uh, our last speaker today is um, Haley. Uh, Haley Hunter Zink is a data scientist in the Center for Optimization and Data Science at the Census Bureau. She holds a PhD in computational bio biology and has previously worked as a data scientist in genetics and clinical informatics. Since joining Census in 2022, she has focused on projects involving web scraping, natural language processing, and machine learning. Uh, the title of her talk is Exploratory Analysis of Enumerator Infocom Documents. And I, as a Census employee, I look forward to uh, learning more about that, Haley. I just want to say thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and myself and my colleagues, just wanted to tell you a little bit about this exploratory analysis of enumerator, enumerator messages of Infocom documents. And just a quick disclaimer, um, any of the opinions are ours alone and not the U.S. Census Bureau, and this has been approved by the Disclosure Avoidance Board. So an Infocom document or information communication document 
So it's just a communication tool. Kelly, you're coming in and out of audio. I I'm okay. not quite sure, um, but maybe adjust your mic. Sure. I think it's actually with my computer. If I speak a little bit more directly towards the computer, does that help? It does. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You might want to I'll repeat to on that. this slide. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. So yeah, just to say, infocoms or information communication documents are are a form that's used as a communication tool um, between census field and office staff during decennial group quarter operations. So to unpack that a little bit, the decennial is the huge census that happens every 10 years, the last one being in 2020. And group quarters are a type of residence um, in which people live, usually unrelated adults, but the residence is actually managed by a third party. So typical examples of types of group quarters can range anywhere from uh, university dorms on um, college and university campuses to nursing home facilities to um, county jails and federal prisons. Um, but during, um, during the census, these um, locations are also enumerated um, to count the residents who live there. And when the enumerators are out in the field trying to collect rosters for these individual addresses um, encounter a problem, they have the option to fill out um, this infocom form to report that problem back to the office. So this form includes information on the top, like who's receiving and sending the information, what operation, the date it was filled out, and then information about the actual location that's attempting to be enumerated, including an address or a description of the location. Additionally, there's a whole statement section that describes the problem, and then if relevant, an answer um, to, to a query can be also be submitted. So the range of problems that can be reported via this, via this form are large. Um, so the um, types of problems they can report can be anything from access issues due to closed or impassable roads to locked buildings that the enumerator can't get access to, to more logistical issues like procedural or payroll issues. So there's a huge number of things that can be discussed in these forms. Um, but whatever the problem is, an explanation in free text can be um, written to describe the problem, any recommendations, and other pertinent information. So um, in the analysis that I'll describe, we're gonna focus on sort of three main components of this form. Um, so we have the address, um, we have what we're gonna call discrete explanations, which um, in the problem statement is a series of check boxes, of which one or more can be selected by the enumerator to describe the problem. And then finally, the free text explanation where the enumerator, whoever's filling out the form can um, provide additional data. So, um, in the standard processing procedure, most of these forms are submitted to the office and then they're actually destroyed. So we wanted to see, is there anything that we can actually automatically extract and learn from these infocom documents that would actually motivate actually preserving these documents for downstream analysis? So there were two main questions that we wanted to answer is, um, do the documents contain valuable information for updating the census master address? So the MAF is essentially the comprehensive list of all of United States um, addresses. And it's this list that sort of seeds the, the frames for enumeration um, during the census or, um, or during um, any relevant surveys. So the way that we'll address this is just to look at matching of addresses to the MAF to see if we can detect any patterns in correspondence with the Second question is um, if the documents contain any information that would be useful for addressing information issues. So we have um, sort of general ideas as to what these issues are. But we're wondering if we get any more information or um, encounter sort of sub themes for each one of these issues. For that, we'll apply the standard natural language processing technique, topic analysis. So, um, because most of these documents are actually destroyed, um, once they reach the office and are processed, we um, were just lucky enough to get a very small um, sample of these documents for exploratory analyses. Um, but fortunately, they do contain a lot of data. So um, the documents are actually all handwritten, and so they had to be digitized uh, via OCR. And we have a sample of about 9,700 documents. Um, these, uh, the actual data extract from the OCR process contains data on all the fields from the form, um, plus a parsed address. So if we look at the actual data content here, we have the percentage of documents that have a value present, and here are all the different fields. So for more than half of these fields, we get sort of the majority of documents at least containing some information, 
Um, whereas some of the, some of the structured sort of structured or free text portions were very rarely filled out, like string map spot ID. But fortunately for our free text analysis, a written explanation is present in about 88% of the documents, at least in some form. So we have, um, we have some data to play with at least. But just a road, just a note, um, the sample that we got was, um, we were very lucky to get, and it was definitely not a scientifically um, sample um, set of documents. So it's unrepresentative. This is just for exploratory analysis, and most of these results probably will not generalize to the total universe of Infocom's documents. You can also look at the sort of parsed address fields. So um, there was one section of the form where um, the enumerator can uh, specify the address or location description. Um, and so here we have sort of parsed out um, address fields like street name, house number, and city. And so about 80% of the documents actually have an address that is um, has enough of these fields to be uniquely identifiable, which makes it feasible to actually try to match to the math. But again, just to repeat, if we look at the sort of subset of documents for which we can identify or map back to a, a state for the address that's listed, which is about 7,000 of them, um, again, this is a non-scientifically sampled sample, so um, we have um, we have some uh, good representation from high population states, but there are a lot of states over which we have no coverage and many states over which we have very little coverage. So again, an unrepresentative sample. So if we actually do the matching to the math, um, we used um, a sort of unit-based matching. So this will match to not only at the address level, but to the sort of unit, if there's like an apartment building with many different units, it'll match to that level as well. We can look at the distribution of residence types to which the Infocom's document addresses actually match to. So if this were a perfect sort of representation of the GQ frame and um, the math for perfect two, what we would expect to see is essentially 100% of these documents would match to just group quarters. But as you can see, we get um, a large percentage of um, the documents mapping to housing units, which are sort of your typical um, apartment or house in which an individual or a family um, would live in, and other types of, of residential units as well, indicating that, um, that these addresses are actually quite diverse. So going back to this form, um, getting back to our first objective, we want to see if we can actually look for um, information in these documents that would help us. In particular, um, we have reported geography map problems and residence type discrepancies in these forms that might provide um, useful information for actually updating them. So we have these sort of dis what we're calling discrete explanations, which are all these check boxes here. And look at the distribution of um, the percentage of documents that he, each one of these explanations checked. So um, we do have the sort of infamous other explanation being um, selected in over 50% of the documents, um, but we do have sort of um, a good representation of refusal and unable to contact um, as well. What we have less um, representation from are the things that we were interested in for sort of math updates, which are other living quarters which would indicate that the enumerator is, has gone to the address, but has determined that it's not a GQ, but another housing type, like just a housing unit. Geography map problems, which indicate that there's some problem with the address, it was maybe not quite right. Or they went to the location and there actually wasn't any building there. So these two actually occur at much lower frequency. But we can still look at sort of the, the patterns um, for these small subsets of documents in terms of the math. Um, so here we just have the percentage of the documents that have at least one match to the math. Um, for all, it's approximately 60%. There's significantly less, less documents matching to the math for the geomap problems, indicating that indeed there does seem to be a problem with the address um, that was made subsequently. Similarly, for the other residence type documents, um, we can look at the patterns of matching. In blue is for all of the documents, and in orange is just for the subset of documents in which the issue is flagged. So overall, we get much for the other residence type flagged documents. We get much less, uh, many less matches uh, across all of the documents, and we particularly get less document matches for um, group quarters. 
indicating that these do seem maybe sort of inflated for um, addresses that are actually matching to other types of housing. So going back, um, we had um, many different discrete explanations had a sort of high representation from these three groups. So um, the documents that flagged uh, some other reason and um, documents that flagged unable to contact or refusal. So um, fortunately there are, um, because we have many of these documents and because many of them actually had a written explanation associated with them, they're not all guaranteed, but many of them did. We had over 4,000 documents with a written explanation um, in the other category and around 1,000 um, each for the refusal and unable. So um, in order to explore sort of sub themes in these um, particular subgroups of documents, we um, used topic modeling. And in this case, we used um, a, a program called top to deck. So very similar to BERT topic, um, it starts out with um, embedding um, your documents using a universal sentence encoder, and then also embeds um, word embeddings in the same space. Um, after that, it reduces the dimensionality of the document embedding um, space and clusters according to an unsupervised clustering method, HDB scan, um, and then um, is able to come up with clusters of top that it represents as sort of topics of documents in this corpus. So um, the next step is kind of where it diverges from um, BERT topic. Um, so in order to associate words with particular topics, um, top to deck will infer the centroid of each one of these clusters and then associate that centroid with um, the nearest word embeddings, therefore associating the words with the topic. So if we look at our particular subgroups, first we'll start out with the sort of other category. So we inferred five topics, and these included, um, for example, in topic one, the most common words of residence vacant occupied. And a manual review of these, um, manual verification of some of these explanations revealed that the enumerators in this topic, especially, were talking about vacant locations. So essentially, they went to um, the address and determined that nobody was actually living there or inhabiting. Another um, topic had properties, tenants, leases as common words, indicated they're talking about rental properties. Looking at some of these examples, it, they were lease that was up or um, the apartments actually being leased to a private tenant, um, stuff like that. So um, either it was vacant or it was. Um, we're unable to contest. We've lost, your, uh, oh. we've lost your audio a couple of times, so just lean in, I guess. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, so um, for unable to contact is two topics. Topic one, having vacant contact residential unoccupied. Again, we're talking about sort of vacant locations where nobody is there to enumerate. Topic two had a bunch of abbreviations like NC um, for non-contact. ND coming from second as in second contact, AM space, week, PM. Sounds like, and from reviewing um, some example sentences in this topic, that they're talking about timing. So essentially, the enumerator would come in the morning, nobody would be there. They'll try again in the evening, second contact, nobody is there. They tried during the week, nobody was present. So it looks like there's somebody living there, but they just didn't connect because of timing. Finally, getting to the final subgroup that we analyzed for refusals. Um, of the five topics that were here, topic four lists important words as respondent, respondent, asked, refused, answered. Um, so looking at some of these examples, um, in many cases, it seems that respondent had actually responded already to the census. And in particular, they had responded that they had already refused. Um, and so now they are refusing again. They don't want, they don't want to take, they don't want to respond to census. For topic five, um, we had words such as HIPAA, um, which is most likely a, um, referring to the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, the act that protects um, health data from covered entities such as nursing homes. Geality, contacted, talked, refused privacy. So it seems that um, privacy and legal concerns are driving some component of refusals. Um, actually, indeed, um, 
it would not actually not be a violation of HIPAA to share roster level information from a covered entity with the census. Um, but it seems that either the enumerator and or the respondent are unaware that it would not be a violation of HIPAA. And so they're, they have concerns about um, sharing this data. And so they refuse to share. So, just to conclude, um, it has many limitations. We have a very small and unrepresentative sample, meaning that um, some of these um, conclusions are unlikely to generalize to the entire universe of universe Infocom's documents. Um, because our um, sample was so small, we were unable to take advantage of training our own embeddings for Infocom specific vocabulary and context um, in the topic modeling. And uh, the clustering itself sometimes latched onto artifacts um, due to sort of an overrepresentation of a particular site or um, or other uh, factor in in the documents. So overall, it does seem that Infocom's documents could provide corrections on GQ addresses and residence types, um, as indicated by the results of the matching to the master address file. Um, however, our I didn't review this in the presentation, um, but we did attempt to train custom sort of spacey NER models to tag relevant information, such as um, address components and um, residence types. Um, however, it proved mostly unsuccessful due to the, our small sample size um, and sort of trying to artificially augment with um, additional sort of publicly available corpora and sort of seeding with some um, artificially seeding with information from input comms was largely unsuccessful. Um, so it looks like there could be information here, but at least with the sample that we have presently, um, it's a little hard to tell if we'd be able to automatically extract this information in production time. Um, but in terms of our second aim, um, we identified access and cooperation sub-themes. Um, so for example, um, for uh, non-contact issues, it seems at least some of them are driven by um, vacancy and timing. Um, and what's interesting is that um, especially vacancy is not one of the discrete explanations listed on the Infocoms form, but seems like it would actually be um, a, a sort of discrete sort of checkbox that might actually be useful. Um, and also there seem to be sort of privacy and legal concerns that are driving some refusals, um, even when those privacy and legal concerns actually do not apply. So I just want to say thank you for your attention and have my contact info. Well, thank you so much, Haley. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, we have time now for uh, Q and A. Um, you can either type in your question, and um, you can type it to everyone or just the panelists, and we'll take a look. Or you can be brave and raise your hand, and then um, our host will unmute you. So I'm going to ask the uh, presenters to uh, put their camera on. And uh, I did see one question in the chat that was answered by Stuart already, and I'll just read it aloud. Um, so Stuart wanted, um, Stephen wanted to know, um, in building the model on the CPU, what was the training time like? Because um, you used the CPU rather than the GPU, correct? Um, and you said um, about 12 hours per epoch. I don't I don't know what an epic is. Could you just say what what that is? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, unlike uh, like a linear model or something, uh, when you're turning a neural network, basically you're able to pass in the data in small batches. So you know you're passing in like 16 or 32 um, observations at a time till you go through all of them, right? So once you go through all of them. And all the weights are adjusted through, you know, the back propagation process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once you've gone through the data once, that's one epoch, right? So the, the thing about neural networks is that as they're um, being trained, you can run the data again through your neural network, right? So you're really, it's unlimited times that you can run the data through, right? Now, there are issues with running high numbers of epochs, right? So eventually you will start to overfit your model. So oftentimes we're doing, um, we're, we're, we're looking at the evaluation evaluation metrics after each epoch, just to make sure that we're not starting to overfit. So one epoch, one round of all training data, two epochs, the, the models basically seen the same data twice. Right. And how big is your data? I wasn't, 
I'm not familiar with your data collection. So like, can you give us an example of what kind of, is it forms? Is it, it's surveys and like, who are, who are the people you're surveying? And yeah, absolutely. Sort of what's the magnitude? So, um, the data I had, uh, the training set that we had was 30,000 comments, right? And those comments for, were from a number of different types of open-ended questions. Uh, a bulk of them came from, um, our WGRC um, survey, which is the Workplace and Gender Relations Survey, and the C stands for the civilian population, right? So that's uh, all civ DOD civilians uh, that got that survey. Um, but some of our other populations are active duty service members, reserve duty service members, uh, military spouses, both for active duty spouses and reserve uh, duty spouses. Um, and then we have a couple of other like smaller niche surveys that we do. We have a WEO survey. We have like a, like a exit poll survey that we've done in the past. Um, there was some really interest, interesting results um, when we modeled all of the surveys at once in the topic modeling. It was able to really identify that the exit poll is like fundamentally different in the way people spoke. And so it was like a really that the cluster of that survey was like a big outlier and basically comprised only of um documents from that survey so the bird so that was like a good way to kind of test the like uh um the validity of the topic modeling and see how robust it is um but anyway so that's a little bit of insight into our surveys uh we have a a, a large number of them and and we do we do active duty every other year and then reserve duty every other year. So we have um, two big flagship surveys, which are the um, status of forces and the WGR surveys. And all of this information, if you're interested in those, can be found on our website. And we mainly do uh, web collection. Uh, we have done paper. Uh, we've started to phase out from paper, um, some paper stuff, but uh, not all service members have access to computers at all times. So uh, web our uh, uh, paper surveys do go out to some service members uh, from our staff. So just so uh, I understand, the 30,000 um, rows, each one is one one survey question from a particular survey. Is that how is that how I should be th thinking about it? It's one answer to one question from one survey. So some okay. surveys may have multiple open-ended uh, okay. Question. How, how does that work? Because you have the same person, maybe has the same sort of pattern, you know, and how they respond to a survey, and so it's almost like um, it's almost like so, if you do a logistic regression, you want to account for that. The same person has sort of multiple instances, right, which can affect perhaps your model. How does? So we sampled without replacement. So okay. when um, we have survey IDs and there's ways to ensure that at least within the same survey, we're not gathering the same person. And then the probability that someone's in the same sample and, and, and like responds um, from year to year from, you know, like two years later is, is not super high. Um, so we, we try to account for that as best we can. So like within a survey, we're only taking one question per respondent. Thank you. All right, so anybody else, ha please raise your hand or um, ask in the chat. I don't see anything. Please let me know if I'm sure. missing something here. I was wondering if I could ask a question. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fine. I was wondering, uh, Stuart, you mentioned that the topic analysis revealed sort of um, the exit surveys as being a sort of distinct entity. And I was wondering if you did a similar um, analysis comparing sort of sentiment analysis and whether exit surveys also stood out in the sentiment analysis. Um, no, we didn't. So. Um... We didn't get a chance to kind of start doing comparisons, right? Like a big, like one of the things I didn't get into is like how robust our um, 
um, topic mo or our um, NLP platform can be because we have a huge amount of demographic information that we know about our service members, right? We know every single individual that takes our surveys, right? And we're able to anonymously or confidentially, uh, confidentially merge their demographic information to their survey comments. Um, so there is potential to do a lot of really in-depth uh, connection between starting to look at distributions of sentiment across any demographic. And that includes across topics, uh, across surveys, across. So what's interesting about when we were doing that testing is that we did a global topic model of all of these survey comments and the machine was, you know, the algorithm was like, oh, these these surveys are kind of different from from all these other ones. Um, but we didn't. Yeah, we didn't uh, then, you know, uh, do the inference on onto the. Um, and, and we and also like we lost like 90% of all all the potential comments that we had due to like we use those for training. So it wouldn't have been like super robust and that exit poll was it was kind of limited in the number of I think it was around 400 or 500 survey responses out of the 30,000. So like a like a small percentage anyway. So that would have been cut down by 90% and then you know so but the, uh, those are the kinds of things that we're looking to do. Um, as we build out the platform is, is be able to merge those, um, the sentiment analysis with the topic modeling and the uh, robust uh, uh, demographic information to really be able to answer just about any research question that, that you can think of regarding the open-ended text responses. So, great question. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, we're out of time. I, I have more questions, but we are out of time. So, I want to thank our presenters and um, I look forward to hearing about your work in future Fed Kasich or other conferences. So thank you all very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for joining our panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, I know that we are the last panel and our charge is to make sure that you remain excited until the end of this uh, wonderful Fed Kasich that we have been part of for the last two days. My name is Romulados Azuine. I am the branch chief for researcher platforms at the NIH All of Us Research Program. Uh, the charge of my division is to ensure that researchers, uh, practitioners, uh, wherever they are, uh, get to become familiar with the platform that we are creating, uh, come to do their research there, disseminate those research studies, and ultimately put them in the hands of uh, healthcare practitioners who will use them to improve health outcomes for you and for me. Uh, we're excited. I have an eminent panel here who have joined me graciously to illuminate on different aspects of the All of Us research program. And so uh, we're going to get started. Uh, but before we start, I just want to quickly announce that all attendees in this session will be in listen only mode. Uh, we are recording this session and it will be posted publicly by the Census Bureau. So may I humbly uh, appeal to you if you have any objections, uh, this would be a good time for you to disconnect. Thank you all. And again, um, Elisa is here. She is terrific. She's going to help us run all the technical um, uh, questions here. Uh, if you have questions at the end, uh, you know, you are free to use the raise hand icon and then we'll give you the opportunity to ask your questions. We also have panel members who are monitoring the chat. Uh, they will try to respond to those chats, um, you know, instantaneously where necessary, but we are going to keep all the questions at the end of the panel. Once again, welcome. Uh, the title of our panel is Progress, Challenges, and opportunities in implementing a nationwide large scale digital research platform for precision medicine. Uh, we have three interrelated presentations today. Uh, the first one is going to be giving us an overview uh, of the entire program. Uh, the second one is going to give us an insight into the work that we have done 
engaging participants, uh, you know, really leading us to getting a greater than 500,000 participants on this study. And the third, and actually I think that is the most important part of this uh, co-related uh, presentation is a live walkthrough of the All of Us Researcher Platform. That is the cloud-based platform that we are using uh, to do the study and to invite researchers to come and use uh, for their analysis. Uh, the first uh, presentation here today is going to be led by Nakia Mack. Nakia is a health specialist within the Division of Technology and Platform Development at the All of Us Research Program at the National Institutes for Health. Uh, Nakia has a both master's degree in public health as well as a master's degree in community health education. Uh, and the title of our talk is Changing the Future of Public Health and Biomedical Research Through Cloud-Based Computing, Lessons Learned from the NIH All of Us Research Program. Now I turn it over to Nakia Mack, Ms. Mack. Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rami, for that wonderful introduction. I would first like to thank my fellow co-authors, Lou Berman, Dr. Rami Azinan and Chris Lunt as well. So now let's get into it. What is All of Us Research Program? It is one of the largest, richest, and most diverse biomedical data sets of its kind. Why does it matter? It is combined by biological factors and social determinants on a large inclusive scale. Who benefits? It equips researchers to make a discoveries that will enable more precise approaches for caring, informing providers' recommendation and individual choices. How do I access it? It is available to researchers with the login.gov credential and institutional sign off across a wide range of settings. Our program is inviting at least 1 million people from across the United States to be engaged in our program. We currently have data from over 372,000 participants. That's major. 80% of are from communities underrepresented in the biomedical research. And of 45 of those communities members are from racial and minority ethnic backgrounds. Our program enables research discoveries that drive more precise approaches to care. It engages people and communities who have been left out of medical research in the past. It combines biological factors and social determinants on a large inclusive scale. It's easily accessible to any researcher with a secure internet connection and a data use agreement. Our program, follows participants as they move, age, and grow. Our program included the first batch of genomic data. Again, our genomic data is only available via our control tier on the researcher workbench. However, we have over 98,000 whole genome sequences, over 165,000 genotype arrays, over 5 million Unique, unique variants. And when it comes to genomic analysis tools, we have Hale, Planck, in addition to R, Python, and Jupyter Notebooks. Now, our reoccurring COVID-19 participant experience, which is also known as the COPE survey, what do we learn from this information? More than 100,000 participants responded to the survey. One or more of six COPE surveys were administrated between May 2020 and March of 2021. Topics were various, and some to mention were social distancing, COVID-related impact, stress, anxiety, and loneliness. When it comes to mental health, the COPE data represented the biggest infusion of mental health data in the researcher workbench so far. Insights included 62% of our participants felt like bothered by their sleeping problems. 53 felt nervous and anxious. 94% have someone to love and someone who made them feel like they were wanted. And lastly, 
95% had someone who had a good time to enjoy their time with. Our ultimate goal is making all of our data accessible to researchers across stages and settings. We have over 4,700 registered researchers across a range of institutional roles and career stages. We have more than over 490 institutions, including 75 historical black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions. Researchers nationwide are using the researcher workbench. So it's, it is being utilized. Research currently underway over 4,000 active projects. 130 publications in peer review journals, and the top conditions being studied in our researcher workbench are cardiovascular disease, hypertension, mental health, cancer, and diabetes. One of the most important things of our program is building a diverse research cohort. Creating a demographically diverse research cohort that promotes responsible and ethical use of data, returns value to the participant communities, and accelerates the research impact. In addition to encouraging student assemblies and early stage investigators to bring fresh creative perspective and innovative research outcomes, we also want to ensure access to all researchers from various institutions and organizations to establish a truly equitable resource for all. With aggregated overviews and interactive previews available to everyone, you can also be and look at this information via our research allofus.org at the research hub. Again, you can see the data snapshots and also search across data types for EHR data, which includes conditions, drug exposure, lab and measurements, procedures, genomic data, and lastly, physical measurement and wearables. Now, I will hand it over to my colleague, Izzy So. Thank you, Nikia, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the part of the session titled Opportunities and Challenges in Implementing a Large-Scale Participant Digital Research Data Collection. I'll be co-hosting this session with Mark Bigale from Vibrant Health. Uh, next slide, please. A quick primer on the All of Us Participant Portal. First, I'll be providing some context of the primary digital platform used to implement the All of Us Research Program, our Participant Portal. Next slide, please. Through the Digital Participant Portal, which can be accessed via the website, joinallofus.org, and the native mobile app, both in iOS and Android, participants can complete a plethora of engagement activities, including completing surveys and scheduling visits for biosample collection. The latter can be completed through the following options of in-person site visits, remote saliva kits, and a remote exam one kit with the aid of a trained examiner. Next slide, please. Thank you. Enabling national enrollment and engagement. With the large and expansive cohort, there are ample opportunities to engage participants using national communications and enrollment strategies. Next slide, please. Since May 2018, the All of Us Research Program enrollment has been open to adults 18 and older nationwide through our portal platform. The program supports account registration, consent requirements, self-reported data collection, participant return of information, and more through our self-service web and mobile applications for individuals with adequate digital access and literacy. Our program partners also enable support for self-service enrollment for individuals, needs access, assistance, or additional information to support informed consent and participation. An additional item here to highlight that has not been on the slide um, is the CADI or Computer Assisted Telephone Interview Tool that helps address the digital divide for some participants. Participants can request the use of CADI to aid in survey completions, among other activities that they want to contribute. Next slide, please. The All of Us Research Program is broadly available and digitally accessible nationwide using our portal platform. Depending on the participant's location, there may be additional recruitment and enrollment opportunities, such as visual rec virtual recruitment, 
and interactive mobile exhibits provided through the program's mobile engagement assets that utilize a planned schedule to travel to locations outside of the health provider organizations, or HPO, federally qualified health centers, or FQHCs, or Veterans Administration, or VA established sites. However, establishing nationwide program awareness and participant support is much more challenging. Ultimately, all of us regional partner networks and their associated direct participant outreach, engagement, and support remain critical enrollment drivers within the program. Next slide, please. The All of Us Research Program has a network of over 400 enrollment sites supported by over 60 regional enrollment partner organizations. The program has full service enrollment sites that have been critical to our success, but this has also resulted in highly concentrated enrollment in geographic markets associated with these enrollment organizations. Next slide, please. In order to overcome some of the geographic limitations associated with our current enrollment partner network, all of us is expanding biosample donation opp opportunities through direct volunteer or DV partnerships, such as with Quest Labs, and can be evidenced by the orange circles on the map seen here. Through this partnership, all of us will add an additional 1,800 biosample collection locations nationwide to better support participants in their communities. Next slide, please. Oh, I think we need to go back one. Thank you. The All of Us Research Program continues to prioritize diversity and representation of participants enrolling in the program. There is a core focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility embedded within the program's core values. Our success can be attributed to sustained investment in community engagement and fostering trust-based relationships with participants. As a program, we have successfully enrolled nearly 50% of participants from self-identified race and ethnicity minority groups and about 80% of all of us participants identify with a group that is historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Next slide, please. Enabling participant choice and protocol. As a program, all of us has been working to increase the flexibility of and improve access to aspects of our protocol, including biospecimen donation opportunities and data sharing from clinical and or digital health data platforms. Next slide, please. As the program has grown, we move, we seek to move beyond healthcare provider clinical centers to broaden our outreach and community engagement. We want to move beyond the clinics to meet participants where they are and to reduce participant burden. To accomplish this, all of us has expanded our methods of biosample collection to match our nationwide enrollment capacity through the use of mailed saliva collection kits, event-based enrollment opportunities, touring enrollment vehicles, and home visits. For example, all of us collected over 39,000 saliva sample kits remotely through postal mail from 50 states and multiple U.S. territories. Next slide, please. All of us currently receives EHR records from our network of enrolling health system partners from participants who are also patients. All of Us enables participants to connect and share health records from over 2,000 health provider organizations nationally. To date, over 40,000 All of Us participants have directly connected records from one or more healthcare providers via their EHR patient portal. However, we have many participants who are not affiliated with our health provider organization network. Next slide, please. Another form of data collection that all of us has expanded over time is participants' ability to connect and share data from a selection of wearable devices and mobile applications. Participants with existing Fitbit, Apple Health, and Google Fit applications can link their data through the participant portal. Digital health technology data aims to expand exposure assessment and enable collection of objective longitudinal data for physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, among other measures. A future opportunity will allow existing participants to receive Fitbit devices and share their wearable data through the participant portal. On the researcher workbench, the program has released an initial Fitbit data set, but the long-term plan is to expand the types of data and devices offered, as well as to increase the number and diversity of participants sharing digital health data over time. Next slide, please. 
And next, I would like to introduce Mark Bigale, who is a PI for the All of Us Participant Technology System Center to discuss additional aspects of innovation that support our program, enrollment, and data collection methods. Thanks, Susie. Next slide, please. So I think the, the previous presenters have given a pretty good view into just the, the breadth and the expanse of the program. But just to give a little bit of insight into the larger challenges that we face as a nationwide program, recruiting over a million people ultimately, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is actually just getting people to fill out surveys and complete tasks. Uh, what I'm going to be showing in just a moment here in this slide and a few other slides are the techniques we've been using to try to boost participant engagement and retention. Some of these aren't innovative insofar as they're, they're new technologies, but they're more innovative in their application in this space. And there are novel and approaches, novel approaches we've had to use to, to make these practical for this kind of endeavor. So one of the approaches we've been using is a no login activity completion approach, which uh, allows for us to expand the ability for the program to allow participants to complete surveys and tasks without requiring them to log in. The standard participant experience for participants required them to log in, and what we were finding is that we had some significant drop off. So what we've done is we've found secure mechanisms to send surveys to participants on verified accounts that allow them to complete activities uh, without having to meet the burden of logging in. Next slide. I think again, uh, this, this slide isn't talking about something that's novel in the general field, but what we've done is we've standardized the processes by which we've, we enable participants to refer other friends to join the program. And the goal here is to make sure that we can understand and instrument the processes by which uh, individuals want to choose to join and also figure out if there are specific types of users or communities that are more likely to refer friends that complete major tasks in the program. The goal for both these activities is to do this in a way that is very sensitive to managing participant information and data. Next slide. And just at a high level, we launched it last year and we have a pretty good uptick for the kind of work that we're doing here. Noting that a lot of the digital processes that maybe some of you may be used to using for this kind of thing uh, don't necessarily work the same way in, in health research. Uh, so the conversion rates that we're getting here, the, the number of individuals we're getting referred to is a, is a pretty high number relative to other types of digital engagement. Next slide. The other thing that we've done, and I think earlier, Izzy mentioned, there's a, a system that we use called the participant portal that is kind of the home base for participants to, to participate in the program. Uh, there's a lot there. If you know, for the purposes of this kind of presentation, we're not gonna dive into a lot of the details. But we've also done in the context of the program is we built an entire toolkit and system to allow study staff uh, and study managers around the country to be able to engage with participants to get them to complete some of these key activities. So as mentioned, participants have to consent online. They provide answers to surveys. They provide digital health data. They also provide their bio samples. Uh, this whole process requires a significant amount of human support in a lot of cases. As Izzy mentioned earlier, there are a fair number of participants that participate in the program without a lot of human support, but a lot of, and the majority of participants presently do engage in the program through one of their existing healthcare providing organizations. So uh, imagine you are a staff person at one of those organizations. This is a tool that allows for you to do things like manage your team, uh, engage and communicate with participants remotely. We have tools that allow for staff members to complete activities on behalf of participants in some cases. We have comprehensive dashboards and reporting that allow for us to use intelligence to figure out how to order and prioritize tasks and status for staff members. And then also there's a whole bunch of, of, of services that we provide and tools that allow for sites to engage with their participants independently, like to build their own websites for recruitment, to create their own kinds of specific campaigns and to create goals for their teams. Next slide. Uh, this is just a high level of uh, Staff members are, are able to send specific communications campaigns, and this is just a snapshot of oftentimes when we send out a large campaign to the program to a, a partner, this is the kind of distribution that we see in terms of, of you know, a 10,000 person campaign, the number of people that complete specific activities. Next slide. So perhaps more innovative in, in technology and not just application, this next section will be talking a little bit about how we've been developing tools that allow for both our teams within the program to use existing innovation to drive new experiences in data collection without having to build a lot from scratch, but also uh, new approaches we've been using to make it possible for the tools that we're building for the program to be used by both researchers and other data collection uh, endeavors out there in the wild. 
So we've developed standardized open access reusable tools. I think there's a, a missing word on the slide uh, for expanding our ability to collect data to from participants and provide them with return of information. Next slide. So at a high level, we are developing an entire experience for participants to provide their data and receive value uh, from being participants. But the this this whole process requires a fair amount of innovation. So what we've done here is we've enabled integration partners like Fitbit, um, people already developing research collection experiences, uh, and also other survey kind of authorship committees to to develop those tools independently of the program, and then. You know, in the context of this diagram, the the all this program and the vibrant health team have enabled standard mechanisms for us to be able to embed that that innovation in the program. In some cases, it's complete data collection tools. In other cases, it's standalone return of information modules that can be shared for other purposes. But the goal is to have a standardized approach so that anybody could contribute their code or ideas or innovations to the program. And then ultimately, that results in the collection of new data, new experiences for participants, and the data ends up in the research hub, which I think you'll be seeing a little bit more of in just a minute. Next slide. So one example of this is the, the process that we're doing to open source data collection modules. Uh, one of the program partners that we're working with is called Many Brains. They develop a range of freely available open science driven cognitive tests. Those tests are completely independently developed by that team, but we wanted to make sure that those those tools could be used within all of us. So if we wanted to develop those tools from scratch, it would be significantly more expensive than working with an existing subject matter expert like the Many Brains team to develop it. So what we did was we developed the tools that would allow them to contribute their modules almost entirely wholesale to the program. Uh, interestingly and importantly, because we are working with a lot of EHR data, We've tried to standardize the way that we collect data from participants and send data to the researchers who are using our workbench using the FHIR format, which is one of the, if not the most common data standard for sharing EHR data. Next slide. So similarly, you know, in addition to the ability to provide and, and support open source data collection tools, we've also built the tools necessary for us to be able to show that data back to participants so that it's engaging. We're about to release this module in a few months, but the idea is that if we want to show an engaging experience related to personality assessment, we could use the same kind of open approach to both develop these tools. And our expectation is not just that we'll be giving these to participants in the study, but that other researchers or users of this type of data could reuse this return of information approach wholesale in their applications if they wanted to. So, for example, in the bottom right hand corner, you see that little microphone and a description about extroversion. That tool is going to be made available for anybody who wants to reuse it for their own work. Next slide. I think I'm passing it on to the workbench team. Thanks, everybody. Great. Looks like I'm up next. So uh, thank you to those past two panelists. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Gage Ryan. I'm a part of the uh, research support team for the Data Research Center um, at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And I worked uh, directly with the help desk, and today I have the opportunity of giving you guys a live walkthrough um, of both the research hub and the researcher workbench, and then some of support materials we have catered towards researchers. So this is going to be like a researcher experience journey. Um, Nakia, if you don't mind, I think I'll just switch over to share my screen here. Not a problem, Gage. Sounds good. All right. I want to make sure everybody can see that. I'm going to assume they can. Um, yes, and then can also, perfect. And then also, if you guys want to follow along with me, I'm on our public website right now. It's called researchallofus.org. And so, like I said briefly, how this is going to look is we're going to talk about the public site, the research hub. Uh, then we're going to go into how to register as a researcher, uh, then we'll jump into a uh, synthetic version of the researcher workbench, and I'll walk you through what that looks like. And then lastly, we'll conclude with some support resources that are developed specifically for our researchers. Um, and so hopefully there's plenty of time at the end for questions and, and we can go back and analyze some other things. But starting here on the research hub, First thing I, I like to point out is going to be our data snapshots, and we could expand these and explore more. But what this shows is going to be the most current, up-to-date views of 
the workbench and of the research hub and the researcher workbench um, from a participant perspective. So as you can see, we have as of this morning or as of today, uh, over 623,000 um, registered participants with the program. And then over 434,000 of those participants have done and completed the initial steps to actually be contributing participant to the program. And you can see the steady incline of our participant growth over time from when we started collecting data back in 2017 to today. And then as we scroll down more too, and I think this was touched on briefly uh, by Nakia earlier, is this geography map here, which also does a great um, just quick high level overview of what our participant counts look like by state. So if you hover over Florida, for example, that's where I'm from, currently about 5% of our cohort comes from or resides in the state of Florida. Then as you scroll down further here, you just get into some more high level um, demographics information that we have about the cohort. So about the participants who are actually within the researcher workbench that you can analyze. Um, so as you scroll down, you can take a look at race and ethnicity, gender identity, and then also age. There's also two more uh, summary statistics here, which are great. And so over 361,000 participants have contributed electronic health records. So those are provided through um, health provider organizations. So they're coming directly from a healthcare professional. Um, and then almost 450,000 have provided bio samples too as well. The next piece I wanna jump to here on the research hub is going to be under the Discover tab is our research projects directory. Might take here a second for it to load. But what the research projects directory is essentially is it's a spot where we can post and show uh, part of the transparency aspect of the All of Us Research Program. Let me zoom in in case it's too far out. Uh, what is actively going on within the researcher workbench? So as you can see, as of as of today, we have 400 or 4,407 active projects going on within the researcher workbench. Now these are not published projects, these are not finished projects, these are projects that researchers are actively pursuing. And so what's cool is you can jump in here and let's look at discrimination in healthcare among different genders with bipolar disorder. We can expand this and we can run through the scientific questions they filled out as a researcher, their purposes for their project, their approaches, their anticipated findings, um, the demographic that they're looking at, and then also maybe what data tier they're using. This is a really cool piece to just be transparent with both fellow researchers and participants to see, oh, maybe what, what is my data possibly contributing to? Um, it also gives a chance for fellow researchers to see, oh, um, you know, who is working on this project? Maybe this is someone I want to collaborate with. I can, you know, find their name. I can look them up, maybe reach out to them directly. And then also last here at the bottom is we also do have a flag too to request a review of this research project. So this also just is an accountability factor uh, for us as a scientific community that if as you're going through and reading this research project and you find any stigmatizing information, you can flag this. It goes to our resource access board and then they'll go ahead and reach out to the owner of this, this workspace and say, hey, you know, your workspace was flagged. Is there anything we need to review here? Um, it's just a perfect accountability piece for the public. Next piece I'm gonna jump to here is gonna be our publications tab on the, the research hub. And so this is where we get to highlight actual publicized projects using the All of Us data. So as you can see, 130, uh, there's been 130 publications using the All of Us data set, utilizing the researcher workbench and the data. And then we'll also take a chance to actually highlight maybe one or two throughout the year of just new and upcoming publications that have occurred, or you can search through all of them that we have listed here. So that we talked about some pieces that you can actually visualize and, and see and just get a glimpse of what's going on. Let's go ahead and start narrowing down to the data about it, because essentially that's what we built this for is to access the data. So the main tool of the research hub when it comes to viewing data is going to be the data browser. 
So what is the data browser? It is a publicly accessible spot to view the data that is encompassed within the curated data repository of the All of Us Research Program. And so when you're viewing it from this aspect, from a public view, uh, all the counts are going to be rounded to the nearest 20th when you're looking at uh, specific condition level information. So that's just a disclaimer. And there is no cross analyzation of these data. So you can't combine two conditions together and get a new count based off of this. This is all to hold the privacy methodology that we have behind protecting our participants because their, their data truly is so valuable to us. And so Within here, you can see you can either select down to a specific type of data you want to analyze. For example, we could select the Fitbit data that was talked about previously. We could look at specific questions in a survey, or we can just keyword search something. So if I was a keyword search cancer, it's going to bring up all the relevant conditions around that keyword. So let's actually jump into the conditions table within the electronic health record data. Now it's going to give us an overview of some of the top concepts based off that condition, also based off participant count. So if we highlight over malignant neoplastic disease, we're going to see we have an estimate of 42,080 participants have this condition showing in their electronic health record. You can then go through further and take a look at these different counts. For our sake, let's just go ahead and you know take a look at this malignant neoplastic disease a little more. So if you click on it here, then you'll get a breakdown of this uh, sex assigned at birth versus this concept. You can hover over and get the counts. You can select over to age. So we'll get an age range of about 10 years between each age range um, uh, for this concept. And then also thirdly, you can also break this down into how was this condition basically put together? Where did it come from? For those of you who are uh, you know, data analysts and stuff, maybe you want to look specifically at a certain type specific, uh, 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 vocabulary for this condition. So you can see that this was built off of ICD-10 CM code here. Um, and you can look that up specifically if you wanted to just use that version. Or when it comes into the researcher workbench, we group all these together into a standard SNOMED code as well. So you can be either very granular or you can be uh, broad in your encompass. So now that we hit on the data browser a little bit, well, one more thing I want to show you too is uh, what it looks like from a survey perspective too. So if we jump in here into the basic survey, so this is the first survey that a participant fills out when they onboard to be a participating participant of the research program. So first question is gonna be, in what country were you born? We can select down and then we can actually see a breakdown of this. Again, these are estimates um, or rounded. And so you can see birthplace within the US, uh, 306,000 participants or uh, just over 82% of the cohort uh, replied yes to that. Um, or they had the option to select other or they could skip the question or they did not answer. So once again, it's just a cool place to go to uh, maybe before you start truly analyzing data within the workbench um, and just to get rough estimate counts of what's going on. Next piece I'm going to show is going to be the Survey Explorer. I like to show this one too because this is another chance to explore the survey material that participants fill out directly. But in this case, we get a chance to view it from the participant perspective. So we have them both viewable in the English or Spanish version. And so if we were to click on the English version, here's the actual PDF of the survey that the participants fill out. Um, so it's also a great place to come to kind of wrap your brain around, okay, where do I want to start when using these questions? What did it look like from the researcher's perspective? How did they read it and how did they possibly fill it out? It helps you later on down the line in your analysis. You also can explore the source material of how the survey was created. Um, and so where these questions were pulled from, because they may not all be original questions created from the All of Us program. So we'll source back to the original uh, survey that it was used from. So now that I hit on, you know, some of the numbers on the Research Hub and then also the data and the tools on the Research Hub, let's talk about how to be, how to get registered 
um, as a registered researcher and access the researcher workbench. So that way you can now explore it in an actual granular level, row level form. So where do you start to register? You're gonna come up here to the register tab and it's gonna be a six step process. Uh, through this presentation that we've all been giving now, you've kind of already done step one, but I do encourage you to go back in, take a chance to uh, explore the data browser, maybe the, the survey explorer and the data snapshots yourself too. Step two is gonna be check if your institution has an agreement. So the way you get access to the workbench as a researcher is through an umbrella effect. Um, while your affiliated institution has an assigned agreement with the All of Us program, you fall under their umbrella, so now you have access to them. Um, so it's not on an individual scale, Access is based off of your affiliated institution. Step three is to create uh, the researcher workbench account. Step four is to verify your identity while login.gov. Step five, you're going to complete some trainings, some training modules. And then step six, sign the data user code of contact. Um, step three through six takes roughly about two hours to do in one sitting, or you can save and come back to it. I do know there's usually questions about um, if your institution has an agreement. And so there's this really cool page set up here. And so this is gonna list all of the uh, institutions that already have agreements signed with the program. And then also what access level they have. This was hit on briefly earlier too, is the workbench is divided up into two access levels, being the registered tier and the controlled tier. Um, as you go and explore more, we have plenty of resources to help explain what the difference between those two are. Don't really have too much time to go into that right now. Um, but so you can, you know, search here, you can control F, whatever you may, you know, whatever you please to do. You can see if your institution has an agreement. You can also see who the contracting official for your institution is. And then in the case that you do not already have, your institution does not have an agreement, you can submit a request here, and then we can get the ball rolling on uh, setting up that uh, agreement with your institution. And before we go any further, just like the, the agreement does not cost any money from your institution side either. The workbench is uh, completely free for the institution and for the researcher to join. Now that we covered that piece, the other piece I do want to hit on is we do know there's uh, been some feedback about some difficulties maybe verifying your identity with login.gov. If you do run into that in the registration process, jump over here to the help tab and then go ahead and click this link login.gov registration assistance form. What that does is it lets us know that you are having trouble. Uh, you'll check some boxes, uh, make sure that you have the right criteria still to verify your identity. It'll send a ticket directly to our help desk and we'll go ahead and try to facilitate you into getting registered uh, another route. So now that we hit on the research hub and how to register, let's go ahead to the fun part and actually look at the researcher workbench. And so how do you get into the researcher workbench? Once you do have a created account, you're gonna do that all still from this main public website and you click researcher login here, and then you'll be prompted to sign in using a username and password you created. So I'm gonna bring over a synthetic version of the workbench here now. So this is the landing page and just disclaimer, this is all synthetic data. Um, so it's able to be viewed by the public, whether you're a registered researcher or not. So this is the landing page of the workbench. And before we go any further, you may be asking, what is the researcher workbench? What's the purpose of it? Um, and so this is the true tool to do the data analysis on a granular level of the cohort of participants that the program has collected and got data for. And so how is this built out? Is it's built out into workspaces. So you can think of workspaces as your projects. And then within a workspace are your tools. So it's where you'll fill out information about what you're trying to do. You'll go ahead and have your tool for creating your, your cohort participants you want to look at. You'll have your tool for creating a data set. And then you'll thirdly, you'll have your tool for actually analyzing the data. So let's take a look at what this is. Um, so the first time you come in here, you won't have anything existing. So you'll go here to the plus button, and you'll create a workspace. You'll follow along through what you're prompted to do and fill out these different uh, research questions. 
And then the piece to highlight here is going to be these publicly displayed tags. These are the pieces that are then uh, transposed onto the research projects directory uh, for that transparency aspect. So other researchers and participants can view what's going on. So as you fill this out, you can know that this will then be posted publicly later on. Once you've filled this out, you'll then come here, Bob, you'll click create workspace. I'll jump into one that I already have created for us. And so all that information that you filled out is going to be sitting here in the about tab. And what I'd like to say is go ahead and try to be as detailed as you can while you're filling this out. The reason I say that is because maybe your research project does change later on down the road, but this is a living document. If you go over here to the right, you can edit this. And so go ahead and be detailed. If something does change, you can edit it, change your questions, change your aim, change maybe the group of participants you're specifically looking at, but we'd rather be more specific uh, in the beginning than uh, vague. Now looking at the data tab, we're gonna touch on our first two tools available on the researcher workbench. The first one is your cohort builder, second one's your data set builder. So what is the cohort builder? This is where you get to take that very large number of participants that we have, as you saw, We've got like 450,000 uh, plus registered participants. So those should hopefully be fully reflected in the workbench here pretty soon um, between our different data releases. And so that is a lot of participants and that is a lot of data. And maybe you only need a sliver of that. So the cohort build builder allows you to select participants based off of certain criteria. It may not load for us right now. There, there has been an issue with the synthetic site. Um, but I can talk through it. So basically it allows you to select participants based off different criteria, that being a certain condition, a certain demographic, uh, maybe an age. You want to make sure maybe they have Fitbit data. You can make all these different inclusion, exclusion criteria so you know that the participants you're looking at all check certain boxes. Once you have your cohort built, then you're going to jump to the data set builder here, which is the next tool to the right. Here is where you actually pick and select the data that you want to visualize and that you want to analyze. So first you select your, your participants. Now you're going to select, okay, I actually want to see their Fitbit data. So I'm going to make that a concept set within the data set builder. Once you've picked all the concepts that you want to include, you'll then proceed to sending this into a Jupyter notebook. I'll jump over to one I already have open. So this is what a Jupyter Notebook looks like, and this is where you'll actually do your analysis of the cohort and the data set that you created. This red code here, when you've finished creating your data set and you click the button Analyze, it'll export code directly into a notebook, and it'll come in the form similar looking to this red code here. So what this is is a SQL query. It basically auto generates all the point and click functions you did. It writes it out into a code. It puts it in a notebook. So now when we run this, it loads it, it pulls it from our stored area in the curated data repository and brings it into your notebook to actually be analyzed. I just have some other quick pre-written code here uh, just to show an example of what I was doing. So what this, this code here is telling me is I've selected participants who have state level information. And then now I've created a data frame of the number of participants based off certain state. Um, and then I can output a graph here and have it all displayed for me. So that's what the Jupyter Notebook is, is it's essentially your place to do your analysis, to write out, you can write readable text, you also write code in here and you also get your outputs. This is where the, the true work is gonna, gonna happen for you. And so this is done in both R and Python coding languages. So now that we talked about the tools of the researcher workbench, we'll transition over into the support resources that we have available for you as a registered researcher. So the first one I wanna talk about is gonna be under featured workspaces here within the actual researcher workbench we have what we call tutorial workspaces. Now, nothing's gonna pop up here again because this is a staging site, 
but when you're actually registered in the workbench, you'll see uh, a handful. I think we're over 10 featured, uh, 10 featured workspaces now. And all of these are written workspaces uh, from the research support team catered directly for researchers for their different cases. For example, one of them is how to get started with genomic data. It's a full walkthrough of truly how to do that. Another one is how to get started with registered tier data. That's the one I highly recommend to anybody uh, starting out. Um, and it's a walkthrough of kind of what we did, but actually within the notebook of what does the data look like? Um, what are the counts for uh, electronic health record participants, the counts for survey participants? Um, and then also it's just a great place to see, okay, what are some things that I can do in either the R or Python coding languages? So that's going to be a resource that's directly within the researcher workbench. We also have our user support hub. So that's going to be under the support tab of the research hub here. And this is where we have all of our support documentation, including getting started information, including all the pre-recorded videos we have from office hours, and then it gets specific into do you have questions about credits and billing? Uh, we have support documentation in there. We have stuff about genomics. We have stuff about getting access to the workbench and how to set up Dura support materials, stuff like that. Um, and so this is basically your, your one-stop shop for if you have a question, come here. You can keyword search your question, see if there's already information built around it. And then in the case that your question may not be answered of what's already built in here, you can scroll to the bottom, submit a request ticket, and that's going to be a direct message to our help desk team. And we'll be happy to try to answer your question or cater to whatever is going on for you. The last piece I'm going to hit before I hand it over into questions, I know I'm a couple minutes over on my time, um, is going to be about these videos. And so we do get questions a lot um, about, you know, through the help desk, is there a chance for you guys to help me walk through this? And so we have started to create a way for us to be able to walk uh, researchers through the progression of if they have questions about using the tools or maybe they're <clears throat> excuse me hitting an error in their notebook through office hours. Office hours are held on every Tuesday and then typically every other Friday. Tuesday office hours, totally drop in style. You can come in, ask a question. Myself and the team will be happy to answer it. Fridays are going to be scripted office hours. Well, we'll actually have a topic to talk about. And that's what you see here under the videos as we record all those Friday office hour sessions and we'll post them here. So essentially just a plethora of information. Um, and I know that was a lot. I'll go ahead and step down and hand it back over. Thank you so much, uh, Gage and uh, panel, uh, all the way from Nakia, uh, through Easy, um, uh, you know, down to Mark and uh, Gage, you guys did really, really a terrific job. And, and I just want to say, um, can you join me to give them a virtual round of applause, please? Thank you. And I also want to thank Sam and Daniel who were answering, responding to questions in real time. I think as a team, we all came here prepared. Mark, um, when you have the time, can you get on camera, please? Okay, so we are now beginning with a question and answer session. Again, um, thank you again for continuing to stay with us. Uh, we know this is evening, but we're trying our best. If you have any question, please use the raise hand button and we will open the mic for you to ask your questions. And uh, we'll be looking at the chats also to read out the questions. Uh, I have a couple there, a couple here already. Um, this is exciting. I have question number one. Somebody really knows about the All of Us research program and they said, All of Us released genomics data last year on the researcher workbench. Uh, can you tell us what is the response from the field? Uh, has that been welcomed? You know, has that made any change? What are you feeling from talking to researchers? So I'm going to let Chris take that question. 
Thank you, Rami. Hi, uh, Chris Lunt, I'm Chief Technology Officer for the All of Us program. Um, and the response has been very positive. Um, we've seen a, a significant increase in the number of researchers that are coming into the researcher workbench um, and specifically to do uh, research in genomics. Uh, and a particular excitement has been the fact that this set of genomics represents a much more diverse population than has been previously available in genomics. Um, the amount of African American and Hispanic American data, for example, uh, really increases the opportunity to research uh, diseases that particularly uh, impact those communities and uh, differences in terms of medication response, et cetera. Um, and so I think we've seen uh, both positive response um, and that the tools have largely met their needs. There are some cases where we got some feedback too, where they needed some more power. And so, uh, we, in fact, we just launched Cromwell recently um, as an additional workflow tool to help with that. Um, and uh, I can just tease that uh, very soon we are releasing the next version of the data set, um, which is going to contain uh, quite a bit more um, genomic data um, and a chance again to, I think, really change uh, the output that we're seeing in terms of genetic research right now. Thank you, Rami. Thank you so much, Chris. That's terrific. I, I think the community is responding to this, uh, the diversity of the data, and, and I'm hopeful that we will one day announce uh, how we are leading the field of genomics data with the WH WGS that we release on the platform. Okay, next question. Lisa, if you have questions, please let me know. Uh, another question came in here said, I have observed that the All of Us research program has been really successful in recruiting participants up to or more than 600,000 participants from the US. Um, can you share what are some of your lessons learned and what are some of the challenges that you have ex experienced? So I'm going to begin that with James, uh, Dr. McLean, and then Mark. Mark is also Mark going to chime in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rami. I appreciate it. I think it's, it goes to the same point that we raised around the researchers. We're really trying to build a research community around the data and the data set. So the same is true on the participant side for the cohort. We're really effectively working to build a, a, research, a, a participant community uh, through engagement with participants. We've been building a network of uh, engagement partners. We have engagement partners numbering in the hundreds, uh, and we've got unique enrollment partners uh, of 60 to 100 enrollment partners doing enrollment for the program. So it's really building the community for outreach, engagement with participants, enrollment support, follow on retention support. So it's building that community that I think has driven the success. And I think accepting the fact that there's really no one size solution. Mark, is there something to add there? I think James stole all my bullets, but I think at, at a high level, we aren't using one approach, we're using many approaches. And I think throughout the slides you've seen here today, you'll see that there are several places and several strategies that we're using and not just one, which allows for us to do things like recruit from healthcare providing organizations, but also recruit from the areas of the country where we don't have a lot of institutional support. And I think we, we didn't dive too much into it here, but there are many different ways in which a participant can participate, which makes it easier for us to get participants that may have challenges pro providing a sample in person, for example. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, yeah, next, this is an interesting question. I think they recognize who Lou is. Lou, Lou, as someone who has attended this, this conference, conference for the last, for the last 20, 20 years, years, what are some what of are the some lessons of the learned lessons as learned you are understanding, you are understanding this, program this program with, with you know, more established national surveys like Enhance or the National, the Health, national Interview Health Interview Survey, survey and so on, or so the difference, you know, what are, what are you seeing at some, some of the similarities or differences? Or differences? So thanks, Rami, for the question, um, and thanks for pointing out my age. I really appreciate that, sir. So. <laughs> Having attended all, I think, all 20 some odd Fed cases, it's a great meeting. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's really exciting about all of us, and I think differentiates it from other studies, and, and there's many great studies that CDC and NIH and other parts of HHS execute, but I think one of the differences um, that I see is a real um, opportunity to think differently about how clinical studies, how population health studies not only get executed, but how we build a community, both from the research side of the house and from the participation side of the house. 
And I think downstream from, from all of that, what you see is this plethora of data that's gone out on the researcher workbench. So we've got communities of people who are interested in coming in and using the data for a variety of reasons. You, we've got folks that are epidemiologists and they're interested in just, let's say, survey data. You've got folks that are interested in bioassay or genomics data, and they've got their set of data that they're interested in. But I think one of the things that's really exciting about all of us, and maybe is a real differentiator when you compare all of us to some other studies, is the opportunity to bring so many different data types together with mass volumes of people. And I think those two pieces are really big discriminators. It's the volume of the number of people that we have. And so that rather than looking at small numbers, perhaps even for some rare genetic diseases or other things that don't occur with high frequency, the numbers are so big in our study that you can see them and really build nice cohorts around that. Um, and you have this opportunity to bring data, data, different data streams together to really advance the science. And, and to me, I think that's the really exciting differentiator between us and other programs. And perhaps something new to, maybe even new to the Fed Kasich community. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Lou. Um, um, another question here. Um, I think this question should be for Gage. Um, you said that researchers who want to use the platform should have their institutions sign DURA, uh, the Data Use Researcher Agreement. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works, Gage? Yeah, of course. And so I, I touched on this in the presentation. And so all of this information that I'll repeat here is going to be accessible to you from the research hub as well under that registration tab and then under step two. But essentially, like right, you said, Rami, the, the Dura data use registration agreement is the contract that allows the institution that you're affiliated with to create this, this umbrella for you as a researcher to jump into the researcher workbench, avoiding any of those individual level barriers or hoops that you may typically have to go through to get access to different data streams and stuff. Um, and so how do you check if, if your institution is in agreement? You could do that from the research hub. And in the case that your institution does not have an agreement, that's where you can submit a, a request for that. Um, and I think Danielle is plugging those into the chat for you as well. Um, and what that is, is that we just ask you to establish, you know, a good contact at your institution, and then everything else is handled on our end. We get in contact with your institution, we go back and forth about signing the agreement, get it passed to the right hands, and then we individually uh, get back in touch with you as a researcher once that's accomplished and say, hey, you're free to sign up as a registered researcher now. Um, these time frames take, you know, can be very different depending on your institution and who you're working with, but typically it's no more than like a week or two, sometimes can be a day, sometimes more, so. Thank you so much, Gage. I have two important questions here. I'm gonna take the first one. This is a technology question. Maybe Chris, that is for you. Somebody is saying, I am wondering how you are going to build this cloud-based platform that will ingest data on 1 million participants. How do you evaluate your readiness to scale up to that amount? How, what do you do on a regular basis, quarterly basis, monthly pay, basis to determine that you are ready for scalability? Chris. I think it's an interesting question, both from an underlying infrastructure perspective, but also in terms of managing the specific data types. Um, we are dealing with petabytes of data at this point. And I found in general, we've been working with Google Cloud Services with a long-term intention to ultimately make this data available in the cloud for researchers to work on both in Azure and Amazon Web Services as well, and have had good support from them as partners in building up that infrastructure, which includes the need not only to just be able to store and move the data around, but also for us to be able to uh, do our job as the stewards of this data from a security perspective. So we're both looking at, too, um, how we manage the data to make sure that it doesn't move outside of our control, to make sure the data is being used in ways that are in alignment with the data use agreement that uh, the researchers have signed and their institutions have signed as well. But I think also some of these now data types are getting large enough that the tools that people used to work on them before aren't working anymore. Um, and so a recent example of where we've been running into this is just the volume of uh, data of 
genomic variants that researchers are having to look at um, means that some things like VCFs are starting to be strained in terms of a way to really deal with that data. And so we've just, uh, just recently put together a new platform, the Variant Data Store, which is a new way to deal with this data. Um, and that's, I think, the first one's going to be a series of new tools that are going to have to be built to enable us to do this. You know, when I first joined the field uh, for health research, you know, the joke was that big data was anything that didn't fit in a spreadsheet. Um, and, I, and I thought it was funny, but I realized it was actually true. Like that is sort of like researchers, like once it got beyond a spreadsheet, they didn't know what to do with it. Um, and you've seen people have to learn to use uh, R and Python and other tools to manage it. But I think we also have a responsibility then to bring tools that allow you to get the kind of data exploration and insights that you could get more easily in something like a SAS, like a spreadsheet, um, and to continue to sort of push the boundaries so that you as a researcher have a chance to identify the patterns that show you where there may be an opportunity for discovery. So I think it's it's a continuous process to go back to the original question, um, both of looking at where are the is the audience that's using this platform right now running into difficulties or challenges. Where are we seeing them not take advantage of opportunities? Like, for example, we have a tremendous amount of Fitbit data um, that is available to researchers. And this is something many researchers have never had a chance to have access to this kind of data before. And we're even pushing how much of that we can put out there. And I think for many researchers, it's intimidating to look at this you know, time series data is a decade of somebody's heart rate and walking data and understand, well, how do I boil that down to understand how that relates to the specific hypothesis that I'm chasing after? And so knowing that we need to build tools and derived data types that make it easier for people to be able to use data like that so that they start to use it. So both where are people struggling, where are people not using data that they probably should be? Um, and where are we ourselves even finding that we're struggling in terms of like moving around really large amounts of data and keeping that affordable for everybody? Um, and Rami, I do want to just touch on one more topic before you go on to the next question too, which is the other element of this is the cloud computing itself. That many people are coming from environments where it was always cloud computing is managed as we have a data center and we spend this much money and this is how much cloud computing we have to give out this year. Um, and then you just got a slice of that and that's what you worked within um, to now where you come to us and we're like, well, we'll just charge you for what we what you use. But many universities don't know how to do that, like just their budgeting processes aren't built around that sort of thing. And we are not alone in sort of struggling with this. We're seeing this across the NIH. We're seeing this at other institutions as well when they start to engage cloud. First thing we want to know is like, well, how much is this going to cost me to go do this analysis? And I think one of our hopes certainly is that we're starting to get a better set of data than people have ever had on that. Like we're now starting to look at like, oh, if someone runs a GWAS, what's the distribution of those costs look like to run a GWAS? Um, and could we start to estimate more up front? If you tell us more about what you do, say like, this is probably going to cost you about this much, knowing that it's also there's a trade-off, right? You can be like, well, how quickly do you want those answers? Because I can get you those answers really quickly if you're willing to spend a lot of money. Um, or we can do this more slowly, and then it'll be much more inexpensive. And so like, this is something that we're solving, and we're doing it not alone. We're working with the NIH Strides program. We're working with others to help bring more uh, data to understand how do you budget to work in the cloud as well. Thanks, Rami. Thank you so much. Uh, great insights. That's really, really great insights. Um, so please, um, uh, forum, keep keep the questions coming. I am learning a lot from these questions as well. Um, uh, let me take the next question. Uh, the next question is actually from somebody said, can I invite any of you to come talk to my group about the program? Um, Gage, I think that is you, right? Yeah, and especially Danielle can um, plug in a link. Uh, Danielle heads our, our outreach. Uh, you know, team and stuff, her and her and Ashley Green. So yes, they'll be the ones to get in contact with, facilitate getting some outreach presentations lined up for you. Yep. And one of the feedback that we continue to get every time is how pleasant the folks at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, our support people, the researcher workbench uh, are. So please uh, feel free. You can email any of us on this panel. You can reach out to uh, Danielle and Tim directly. We will organize to come. We will organize to do virtual presentations and actually engage with you to use the data that we have. Another question. Um, I think, Mark, this is going to be you. What is your vision for the Sorry. What is your vision for the program? Are you going to be digital only platform or are you still going to be this combination of in-person and digital? 
in terms of sure. your recruitment? I'm not sure I'm the only person that should respond to this question because I think there are several perspectives on this call about that. At least from, from the perspective of my team, I don't think there's a single recipe for doing this, but the pieces of it that we're supporting are largely a combination of the digital and non-digital. I would be curious what Lou and James and, and Chris have to say on this topic, but I think ultimately, even the tools that we're supporting presuppose a reality where not everything can be digital if we want to, true, to achieve a truly representative sample. But what that looks like state by state, population by population is, is a more complicated question than a single answer. Our, our approach at the PTSC, which is the group that has built those tools, is really to facilitate wherever the, the need is. So if we have a challenge in recruiting a specific type of population, we'll build the tools that we can that, that support the aims of engaging with that. But in terms of the vision, I don't know, James, Chris, Lou, I think we're willing to go anywhere where representation and the scale of the programs can be achieved. Yeah, I'll just uh, take it briefly just to say, I agree. I mean, we, as a program, we've been doing facilitated support since the beginning of the program, even though all of our data has been collected on a digital platform uh, for many of our participants, that's with, uh, you know, a facilitated study support staff member there uh, helping, supporting, or, or, or participating in that engagement. Uh, we've also launched a computer assistive telephone interviewing uh, uh, process for the program to aid our retention uh, of participants over time. And I think we're we're open and uh, exploring opportunities for other for other modes of study participation over time as well. So I agree that I think it's you know, we're going to uh, probably see expansion there over time. And if I may jump in, we have two questions in the chat. Rami, is it okay if I read those out? Yes, let me take one of them that I saw right now uh, because it's related to participant. It says, and I love this question. As the research platform branch, I love this question. It says, what happens after we recruit 1 million participants? Is the All of Us program building a 10-year, a 50-year, or a perpetual database? Really fantastic question. So we can let, begin from the top and come to the bottom. Chris, what is the vision? Are you building a 10-year, a 50-year, or a perpetual database? What happens if we reach 1 million participants in 2025? Are we going to disband? Uh, so the answer to this depends on Congress. Um, and, and so we are really trying to make a very strong argument that you got to keep this going, that this is the next uh, Framingham Heart Study, right? Like that the longer we track people, the more we get to understand about the progress of disease, the development of disease, risk factors, and everything else. Um, and so, but we're going to need money to come in every year for that to happen. Um, I will say the program is very thoughtful then too about recognizing we're going to go through periods in our life cycle. And right now we're still in this period of building out a lot of our basic capability in terms of our recruitment. You heard sort of, you know, Mark was alluding to a lot of the work that we're doing in terms of how can we do uh, biosample collection without requiring people to go somewhere. So how can we, you know, send the biosampling to the people? And so there's work like that that will allow us to figure out what are ways to manage our costs so that we can keep this going as long as we possibly can. As a collection of scientists, we love the idea of being able to keep this going. Um, as a set of bureaucrats who have to sort of deal with this from a budget perspective, we're doing what we can to make that possible um, and, and recognize that in the end, it's gonna come from the fact that we have to prove our value to show that it's really worth doing. And I think and we're well on the way to doing that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Danielle, could you read uh, one of the questions you have? We take them one after the other. Yes, um, we have a question from Carl. He says, I'm new to this. Would it be right to think of the research cohort as a very large non-probability panel? If so, are there metrics such as um, attrition or refreshing of the panel that survey researchers could use to think about all of us like other panels? Hmm. This is a new one. So we see. Lou, come on, come on take on, it. Take it. <laughs> yeah, Carl, that's a great question. I think the way to think about all of us um, and this, we should also think a little bit about the discussion and the answers that James and um, Mark gave about how to recruit populations and how to maintain the population of people in all of us. But the way to think of it in some sense is that the sampling frame for all of us is the entire United States rather than a select set of geographic areas. 
Having said that, if you look at where we primarily recruit from, it's where our healthcare provider organizations exist, and many of them are in large geographic areas. So we've got a lot of representation in California, in Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Wisconsin, et cetera. But we've got um, participants that live all over the United States. So we're not, we're not really being driven to be a representative study. It's a convenient sample. And in some sense, we do have to deal with attrition because people are gonna pull out of the survey for a variety of reasons. Either they may lose interest in the study, they may forget about the study, they may withdraw, even though we have a very small percentage of people that withdraw. Right now, we're not in some sense replenishing that based on who's withdrawn from the study, but that may come later. And in fact, later this month, we have a workshop we're putting together on inferential statistics and how can we drive the study in some sense to produce uh, statistics out of the study that would be re representative of the entire United States population. And there's a lot of things to take into account that may be um, subsampling or sampling specifically in certain geographic areas to round out who we've got in the study. It may be looking at um, uh, where we've got missing data and trying to take that into account with waiting on the back end or non-response. So there's a lot of different approaches to that problem, but um, I would say, you know, think of this as a, in some sense, mostly as a convenient sample with representation from very specific groups of people who've been traditionally underrepresented in my biomedical research with an opportunity uh, to perhaps produce representative statistics um, to be determined, but, but those are the directions we're heading in. Thank you so much, Thank Lou. Thank you so and, much, Lou. And, uh, and by the way, footnote here, that question around what happens after we hit 1 million participants was from Howard Spicer. Howard, I think you have the best question in this panel. Yeah, Danielle, another question? No more questions at this time in the chat. Yes, uh, Mark. I just wanted to comment that one of the differences in this cohort from maybe a traditional survey cohort is that some data types don't really have a time component. They're not really time bound. So I think Lou commented on it, but as important as continuously refreshing the sample is noting that some of the data types here are going to, to be usable in perpetuity as long as the participant remains a participant. So another challenge we have is just to ensure the participants, you know, are continuing to trust the program so that they remain participants and not in all cases expecting them to continuously engage. And that, that's another value of all of us that some other studies may not have. Very good insight, Mark. Um, one other question is, uh, and Lou, I think you point uh, you alluded to this one way, which is the inevitability of attrition by participants. So the question came in, how do you retrain people so that they will keep doing this service along across the years. Um, you know, what, how do you retain people? Because, you know, you need to keep an eye on the number or proportion of people who are going to, you know, disenroll every year or every quarter. And then that is going to be factored in, in the overall end, assuming that you say the target end or the ultimate end is 1 million. And then you have, let's say, annual attrition of 10,000 people. How do you plan to retain that nine, you know, 900 plus 990,000 and also retain that? What, what are some of the strategies that you are taking if you have started thinking about this attrition? James, maybe you can start that. So I think there's a couple of aspects. One is that I think as a program, uh, we aim to retain as many uh, participants as possible, but we accept that we are probably not going. We are not going to retain them all, uh, and so I think that we're we're beginning to think about the longitudinal aspects of the cohort with an expectation that there is a fraction of the cohort that probably will not continue to engage, or will not be fully engaged. Right? They might uh, period you know, periodically engage with the program. So they, that acceptance is the first thing. Then the second after that is you know how do you optimize the engagement of the participants who are uh, involved, right? So, how do we, you know, how do we approach the levels of retention that I think uh, have been achieved historically in uh, uh, health research uh, for longitudinal cohorts, and how do we get all of us up to the same level of retention? Um, been significant investment in that as a program over the last couple of years. Uh, that is uh, continuing to improve our. Uh, uh, re reduce our data missingness and improve our participant retention. So I think that more work to come there as a program of our scale, 
uh, and as a program that had a kind of a digital orientation as a basis, uh, as I think a lot of digital programs have seen lower retention, and it's been a, a, a effort to overcome some of that uh, general expectation. Thank you so much, uh, panel. Um, I, I want to tell you how terrific this panel has been. Great insights, uh, great opportunity to engage this study. I have been very privileged to be the person asking the questions. I didn't get to do anything. So I really want to thank each of you for your presentations, for your thoughtful responses, and for all of you who have joined us uh, till late this evening. I want to thank you and to our hosts, uh, the Census Bureau. Out do really want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given to us to present this panel. I'm hoping that we will have the opportunity sometime to be able to do this in person and get to meet all of you. Finally, I would like to thank uh, Lisa, who has been really terrific in making sure that everything works uh, really seamlessly. Uh, we are very fortunate and we are looking forward to God's uh, grace uh, for us to return next year and share more insights and lessons learned. So at this point, I'm going to close the panel side. Um, once again, if you have any questions for the All of Us program support at researchallofus.org, I'm going to hand the question over now to our host, uh, Dr. Ramirez, who is going to present some concluding remarks. Panel, stay where you are. Don't leave. Well, thank you very much. And hi, everybody. I'm Carl Ramirez from the USGAO. And we have come to the end of another Fed Kasich. So, on behalf of the Fed Kasich 2023 Planning Committee, I want to thank all of you for being a part of it. Uh, and just remember, it's, it's your expertise and experience and your interests in this space that have kept this project going for as long as it has. I just wanted to say that um, everyone who registered through the website should be getting a post-conference email or two from us pretty soon. First, you're going to get a survey request to provide feedback so we can improve the event. And later, we will announce when the session recordings and presentation slides uh, have been posted to the Fed Kasich website. So finally, thanks for your involvement and patience. And we hope to see all of you back next year to present and attend. So have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.